Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer with the Veterans History Project out of Washington, D.C. and conducted by the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library under the leadership of Brian Powers, who today is operating the camera. Today's date is the 25th of October, 2016. And we have the honor and privilege today of interviewing Edward Stewart Harris, better known as Pete. Correct. And it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Glad to meet and, you, sir, uh, and do this. Uh, it's all right just to call you Pete. Do That's the only thing I answer to. Okay. Uh, Pete, uh, where were you born? Cincinnati. And um, what area? Uh, well, I, I lived in... Uh, what they considered Avondale, it was right across the yellow line from St. Bernard at the corner right. of Vine and Mitchell. Vine and Mitchell, certainly. Um, and your parents' names? My dad's name was Edward. My mo mother's name, I found out later, I always thought it was Judy, and I found out her real name was Julia. Julia. And, and where did you, uh, what was your street address? 17 East Mitchell Avenue. 17 East Mitchell. And what did your father do for a living? Uh, he worked at a place called Metal Specialty for a while, which sure. did metal stamping and that, and did uh, a lot of stuff for the U.S. government. Down on Spring Grove and uh, Winton, if I remember Yeah, correctly. well, it was actually off of Spring Grove and right. Winton back some. And uh, then later on, he went work when he basically retired from there. He went to work for a vending company where he was in their accounting office. Now, which vending company? Well, it was called Stern Vending back sure. there. It later became AAV. Uh, yeah. Stern Vending, yeah. <clears throat> Incidentally, my uh, uncle worked at Metal, Cincinnati Metal Specialty there, making uh, ammunition. Yes, stations. you're correct. Yeah. That's what they used to do there. Yeah. Uh, did, did your mother ever work? Yeah, she uh, worked for a few years. She was a demonstrator. The old Bendix washing machine and dryer mm -hmm. company. Sure. When you bought a washer and a dryer, or a washer or a dryer, they'd come and install it, and the next day she would come out and show you how to use it. I mean, the thing she had a big plastic top that would go on top, so you could watch the cycles and all that. I'll be done. And I remember as a kid, a few times I was off school, and that I had no choice but to you know go with her on these. You know, something you never hear about anymore. Well, we need that more today with all the push buttons we got. Yep. Uh, did you folks belong to any particular church when you were growing up? Uh, there was, I can't even think of the real name of it. It was a little church in St. Bernard. And then I also, with some of my buddies later, I went to St. Clemens with them, even though I wasn't Catholic. I went over to church mm -hmm. with them because they went in the mornings and, hey, we're all together as a crew, so. Sure. <laughs> Uh, what schools did you go to as a child? I went to St. Bart Elementary. Then I went to Woodward High School on Reading Road, 7th mm -hmm. through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you go to college at the high school? I went to UC for about a year, year and a half. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, while you were going to UC, were you married or were you still single? Or I'm trying, I was single at the time. Okay. Uh, and what year is this now that we're talking about that you're okay, in uh, second year of? It'll have been 64. I see. Excuse me, 65. Now, had you been employed anywhere while you, while you were going to school? or? I worked at a Ohio gas station at the corner of Vine and Mitchell. I was one of their mechanics down there. And yeah. Were you mechanically inclined all through high school? Yes. So... Uh, in 1964, the, the Vietnam War was going on, or getting ready to accelerate, I guess. Uh, did you join the military at that time, or were you called? No, I uh, I enlisted in 1966. 1966? Yes. And what was the date of your enlistment? Uh, March 13th. It was, a, well, it was actually March 14th, but... When I went down to sign all the paperwork, it was the 13th because it was a Friday the 13th. Right. I remember it well. Yeah. March the 13th, 1966. And you joined the Marine Corps? Yes. Uh, where did you go to join up at? What was Just it? downtown. Uh, was that near Government Square at that time I, or not? 
I think so. I couldn't really. Now, did you have any trouble with your parents about joining? Eh, a little yes, a little no. I had a brother-in-law that was in the Marine Corps. Uh, all my dad's family had been in the service, either the Navy, the Air Force, etc. But I decided I wanted to be a Marine. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. I have. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea. It just seemed like the thing to do. I went down. I talked to the recruiter, and he was telling me different schools I could get into. And I liked the sound of being able to get into an aviation school. And that's what you wanted to do was get yeah. an aviation school. Yes, sir. So, uh, so you joined on the 13th, and when did you leave? Uh, on the 14th. On a Saturday. It a, uh, they put us up in a hotel for the night downtown, and the next morning we got up, got on a bus, they took us to the airport, they watched us get on the plane, because back then it was, you came on from the tarmac and climbed the steps, right. and a gentleman came with us, and there was a group of probably 20 to 30 of us, and next thing I know, we're in San Diego. San Diego, that's where you went through basic? Uh, yeah, I was what they call a Hollywood Marine. Uh -huh. So tell us about your basic training. And how long was it? I want to say it was, <coughs> it was over 12 weeks. And then ITR was a form of basic, so altogether it was around 16 weeks. And the only way you can describe it, if anybody has never been to a Marine Corps boot camp, is at first you think you're gonna die then you get to the point that you're kind of happy you're surviving and then towards the end of it you have become where well, you're actually starting to they tell you to run 10 miles you'll say okay let's run 15 miles where you're pushing back on the DIs uh, you're called every name under the Sun you get roughed up a little bit but I think there were several times in Vietnam that when I flashed back to my boot camp and my ITR, which was Infantry Training Regiment, saved my life with reaction, where you didn't think, you reacted. Uh, when I went into boot camp, I thought I was in pretty good shape. Well, they decided, I went in weighing 235 and they decided that it was too big, so they put me on what they called the rabbit food, which you just got all salads and you work. Well, when I came out of boot camp, I weighed 237, but it was their way, not what you 237, and how tall were you, or are you? 6'4", 6'5". 6'4", 6'5". While you were in boot camp, did you get training in aviation? No, no, that was a school later. Okay. Boot camp is nothing but boot camp. And then after you get through all of that and you survived, you go to what they call ITR, Infantry Training Regiment, up at Camp Pendleton for four weeks, where you do all kind of shooting and stuff, you know, like you, because every Marine is an infantryman. That's your first job with the Marine Corps. After that, I got a 10-day leave that I could come home, and then I had to report to Millington, Tennessee, which is right outside of Memphis, and that's where I started my aviation school there. How'd you get home on your first leave? Uh, I took a plane home. Okay. So you had a 10-day leave, and then they sent you to Millington? Millington, yeah. Millington. Uh, how do you spell that? I'm not sure. It's just, it's it's almost like a suburb of Memphis. Memphis. Okay. And, and what was that, what did that school entail? Well, it depends on what you were down there for. They had m many of the aviation schools. They had avionics. My school was jet engines. They had people there that were learning to be crash crew people. They had people there that were learning to be metal shop people. You know, they had many different schools on this complex down there. And like I say, my school was going to be a jet engine, become a jet engine mechanic. Mm -hmm. And how long was that school designed to be? Let me, I think it's got it on here. I don't know. I can't even remember now. Four weeks? Eight weeks. Eight weeks. Eight weeks of school there. Uh-huh. 
Yes, I see that. So uh, you're being trained to be a jet engine mechanic. Yes. So naturally you're thinking about going to an aircraft carrier. Well, I don't know about an aircraft carrier. I was thinking my probably going to end up in uh, working on jet jet planes and stuff. They told us when we were in this school, they says, and this is the exact quote I remember all my life. Blank, blank, if you flunk out of this school, you will be immediately shipped to Vietnam where you will become a grunt. And I laughed later on because two of my friends flunked out. One of them ended up with embassy duty in Sweden and the other one ended up with embassy duty in Norway. <laughs> and they, they used to send me postcards when I was in Vietnam. Tough duty. <laughs> so uh, you graduated then after yes. your eight weeks training. And um, what rank are you at this time? A uh, PFC. PFC. And um, where did you go from there? I then got another 10 days leave and I was being shipped out to Vietnam. So I was, I come home, spent a few days here. I got out to San Francisco, spent one day in San Francisco. Then I reported to Treasure Isle, which is a Navy base out there. I was there three days while they got our shots all caught up. And then they sent us right to Travis Air Force Base where we got on a big C-130 and seemed like for the next two days we were in the air flying to Vietnam. I actually slept in a Jeep the one night because they had a row of seats down the side and they had Jeeps and stuff inside the C-130 and to get a little leg room I got in the back of a Jeep and slept. But we flew from Travis to Okinawa. At Okinawa, did you land at Kadena or not? Uh, or not? Uh, I can't think of the Marine Air Base in Okinawa. Okay. I, but we were there a couple of days, and then they packed us back into C-130s, and we flew into Da Nang, in Vietnam. At which time, they call your name. They say you stand here, you go there, you, and. You what, know, what month and year is this? Oh, uh, this is July of 1966. Um, this, you know, I, I went in in March and by, or was it August? I don't know, but anyway, I was in Vietnam mm -hmm. right out of all my schools. Okay. And it's the year 1966. Yes. Okay. What was Da Nang like? Uh, just a mess. A snafu. And you know what a snafu mm -hmm. is? Well, that's what it was because you had people coming, people going, transports landing, one right after another, just stuff being moved. Well, what they did is you went into this building and they says, okay, Harris, said, yes, sir, you go stand over there. Smith, and they'd, you go, well, some of them got sent to uh, fixed wing squadrons that were at Da Nang and Chulai. Uh, they told me I was going to a place called Key Hall, which was right above Chulai. And I got up there, and the first day up there, they says, okay, fine, we got your orders. Tomorrow morning, you report to this big hangar. Well, it was a hangar where they worked on jet engines. Next morning, of course, 6 o'clock in the morning, you get up, you go to what they call the chow hall. You got down to this hangar by 7. I walked in there. I was in there about two hours and they says Bubba and I'm working on this little engine you know just doing some st minor stuff that I knew and they called my name and I walked over to the sergeant I said and still being new you know sergeant says sir then I said sir he says get your gear you're to report to VMO 6 and I says what is VMO 6 and he says it's a squadron it's on the other side there so go up back up to your little barracks, get your gear, come down and report to them. Here's your transfer orders, and you're going to be with them. Okay. I get my sea bag, and I come hoofing it down. and Sir, I'm PFC Harris reporting, blah, blah. And this guy looks at me, big black sergeant, bellowing voice. And he says, you're assigned to my squad. Yes, sir. He says... Do you know what that is? And he pointed to a Huey. And I'm pretty smart, right? I says, 
Yes, sir, that's a helicopter. Oh, wrong thing. I was quickly informed that it was a UH-1 Echo. And I, yes, sir. Let me store my bag. You can see that down at the other end down there? More far end of the marsh matting? <coughs> and I see a thing that looks like the outline of a helicopter, but it's wrapped in silver paper. Doesn't have any blades or nothing on it. And I look and I says, yes, sir. He says, that's your bird. You've got one week to get that bird up and flying, or you're going to be on mess duty for the next 13 months. And it was what they called it was in a cocoon. And a couple other guys got assigned to help me from metal shop and that, and we pulled the bird up and we cut it out. And I went up to him, I, I asked a question about what to do, and he looked right at me, and he says, RTFB. And, Sir, what do you mean? Read the blanking book. And he gave me the instruction manual how to assemble a Huey. We got the thing up and flying in four days. And that was my bird for all the while I was in Vietnam. And that was a? <clears throat> UH-1 Echo. UH-1 Echo. Yeah. It was a Huey. Uh, ours was an Echo because we had rotor brakes. The Army was flying Deltas and Franklins and that because they didn't have rotor brakes on theirs. The Marines had to have rotor brakes to land on ships so mm -hmm. we could lock them rotor up and push it off to the side mm -hmm. just like all marine corps aircraft have to have folding wings mm -hmm. so that's how i got broken on a uh-1 i became the crew chief of that bird immediately what is the what are the jobs of a crew chief well in our outfit the crew chief you're the head mechanic you fly whenever that bird flies if anything's wrong with it, you got to figure out what's wrong with it. You got to clean it up. You got you name it, you do it. And the case of our squadron, they actually took crew chiefs like me and they taught us to fly because we would fly what they called dirty slick missions where we'd just drop our rocket pods and we'd only have one pilot. But we would be flying in bad guy country, Indian country. And this way we knew how to fly if the pilot got shot. We could still fly that bird and land it safe. What were your primary duties as fly, flying the... Well, depending. If I was a crew chief, my primary duties was making sure the guns and rockets were working, functioning, to assist in when they were going, we were going in on a gun or a rocket run, to work the switches, which was on the console up here, back and forth, whether they wanted rockets or guns or whatever they wanted at the time, because... Usually if we were in Indian territory and going on rocket runs and that, the co-pilot would be on the controls with the pilot at all times. So it was my function to take care of that. It was also my function to listen to four different radio channels at once. AM, FM, uh, high frequency, and I can't think of the other one right now. But they, they had the same stuff we had plus the intercom, but to make sure they didn't miss a broadcast like we were flying into naval gunfire, flying into artillery fire, or flying into a B-52 arc light, which was very exciting to fly into. Um, so I'd be listening to all that, plus working a machine gun in back, making sure the other guns, exterior guns, are working. Uh, if something would happen to a pilot or a co-pilot, it was my job to get them out of their seat, get them in back, and me to climb up there with the, whoever was remaining. How many men were on? Uh, four. Four, and you had, uh, the, the pilot, did he sit on the right side or left side? He was uh, right side. Right side. Co-pilot, left on side. The left side, and then crew The crew chief. chief sat left side rear, and the gunner sat right side rear. Okay. So, and our seats, their seats, there was two levers you could pull, and the back would just fall over backwards, where if one of them got hit, you'd flip it back, and if they were hurt real bad, pull them back and try to work on them. They just hurt reasonably bad where they, you know, get them back there. And my job was whoever it was, the pilot or co-pilot, to get up in that seat and be become the co-pilot to whoever was left flying. Uh -huh. I was lucky enough that I never had to do that part of it. A couple of my friends did, but I never had a pilot or a co-pilot shot up real bad. 
but so you're assigned to the VMO VMO six. Six. And it, what does that mean? VMO. It's uh, Marine Observation Squadron Six. The V stood for lighter than air. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The M, Marine, Marine. and O, observation. observation. And six was our squadron designation. Okay. So you have finished uh, uh, putting together this Huey, I guess. Is that okay to yeah, refer that's, to Yeah, it's the Huey? only way to call it is a and, Huey. Uh, so what happens then? Okay, I, I got it assembled. It passed the uh, test flights and everything. And then it was my bird. And they made it very clear whenever that bird went anywhere, I was going to be in it unless I was on R&R &R or whatever. And it was mine to do all the upkeep. I mean, there was times that me and my buddy Crutch and Shive and Lurch and all them, we'd work all night long to get one or two helicopters up because the next day they, let's say they needed 20 helicopters for a mass operation. Our squadron had 24. But two of them were slick, so they were all, always out of the game. And there was times that we worked till 3, 4 in the morning, and we actually got a couple pilots to take them up to test flight, even though they weren't supposed to. They signed them off if they had the test flight at 0600 or 0630, even though we were doing this at 4 in the morning. And sometimes we just, you know, we got done, we crawled right back on our bird, and we slept there till it was time. Because I think every launch in Vietnam was called zero dark 30, meaning... That's when you launched. It was always dark. You know. So, I guess at this point, then uh, you're going to be called out for missions. Yes. Now, you recall your first mission? I recall I was scared shitless. I recall when all the guns and rockets started firing, it was louder than hell. And as the old saying goes, and I'm sorry, camera, but your butt puckers. I remember that. I remember there was a whole lot of shooting, both going and coming. Uh, and it, it lasted a couple hours. Your missions when you're uh, when you're sent out are they to rescue men or to take in? Uh, we did everything. Our our squadron was unique in the point that we did insertions. We did. Uh, Medevac, we did picking up people, we did observation forward air control for whoever was flying around in the big bad jets at the time, or the AD-1 Sky Raiders. Uh, our squadron did everything. Uh, my one cruise book over there, we had a, one of our mascots was a uh, pussy cat, kind of a weird cat. Well, one of them shows him carrying a, a, a stretcher. And then a couple of years later, or a couple of months later, the squadron emblem changed to show him carrying rockets and guns. But those particular our patches that went on our flight jackets, the cat had big brass balls. And we were known throughout Vietnam. Okay, this is one of the later ones. You can see we're still an observation squadron, but now we're carrying rockets. Mm -hmm. One of the early ones is just like this, but instead of a rocket here, it's a stretcher. This is this book was called the sandwich. This was just cherry six because our emblem was a six, and it was cherry red. And then this one here was called the Klondiker. That was one of our call signs. And you can't see it because it's real dark, but it's Wiley Coyote was our squadron squadron emblem. Mm -hmm. uh, which one is it here? I don't even know. But they got all oh, air. Yeah. This one shows our different squadron emblems, which the rocket. The stretcher, there's Wiley, and he's kind of blown up, as you see. And then we're also known as the Klondike Playboys. 
and that's when we would be doing uh, forward air control for the fixed wing. But those were the emblems I had on my flight jacket. Well, this is going to be uh, an education for the year 1966 to August or to uh, around August 1967. 68. 68. I went, got over there in 66. I didn't come home till 60, August oh, of 68. I extended. Oh, you okay? Well, if you would. Um, if you could tell us about some of your missions and um, well, and you can do it in chronological order or in any order that you wish. Our missions, like I say, just where you went and every, every day you got up. We we started when I first got to the squadron. It was in Kehoe, which was above Chulai. We weren't. I wasn't with the squadron long there. The squadron wasn't there long, and we moved up above Fubai. And after a few more months, we moved up to Quang Tree, which was just south of the DMZ. Excuse me, the DMZ. Our missions were aerial gun support for the grunts, resupply, insertion, extraction, medevac. Uh, I was actually detailed for four and a half months to a special forces unit, where we lived right with the mountain yards outside of Quezon. Now, were the, that was Army, United States Army. You remember the uh, outfit you were with? All I remember is the people, and it was an A-team. And the head of it was called Cowboy, and he wore two pearl handle six-shooters. But we were with them, me and my buddy Crutcher, who's also from Cincinnati area. Our two birds were up there through, the, through that time, through the whole duration of Ted of 68. We were the only two Huey helicopters up there. And we lived with the mountain yards. Uh, these little people, the lowlanders didn't like them. Nobody really associated with the mountain yards over there. Uh, you could give them guns and they'd refuse them. The only weapons they wanted was their blow gun and their crossbows and a knife. So we were always trying to find what they called K-bars, the survival knives, to give to them for just thanking them. And, mm -hmm. Well, like I say, we, we flew a lot of missions. We flew night missions. Uh, an average mission would go anywhere from two to 10 hours, depending. And in, in that two to 10 hours, we have landed numerous times. We rearmed, refueled. I actually carried extra munitions and rockets in my helicopter where I could rearm and refuel in midair. And sometimes they kind of wondered about me climbing outside a helicopter, but a couple that, we didn't have we didn't have no better sense of few of us. Mm. Um, you say refuel in air. What do you? No, mean? we didn't refuel in the air. We rearmed in the air. Okay. We what we did what they call hot refueling, and that was <coughs> anything from landing where they actually had a refueling truck, <coughs> and the chopper was never shut down. You're just fueling it up, to landing in an area where they had 55 gallon drums with hand pumps. Right. And you know, our average flight time was two to two and a half hours before we had to refuel. And like I say, you, you're allowed to go out on a mission at six o'clock in the morning and not come in until eight or 10 o'clock at night. Uh, other times, you racked up a bunch of missions if you were on medevac. Because every time you would go out on a new medevac, that was another mission. The only thing was for a mission to count, towards your air medals and that, it had to be a hostile mission. You had to get shot at. You know, it couldn't be just flying mail down the coast of Da Nang or something. Now, an air medal uh, means five missions or more? Ten. Ten missions. Every ten missions, you got what they call an air medal. Right. I ended up, well, according to my DD-214, I had 45, but I actually had more, but they never caught up with me before I was discharged. How many? I'm... I'm pretty sure I, I went well over 500. I did an interview with Life Magazine or Look Magazine in country. And they asked about my medals. And I said, you know what? They don't mean nothing to you. They don't. Some people they did, uh, the ones that didn't fly much. The guys that were in the air all the time, we could care less how many metal, air medals we had. I got a single mission air medal, which is quite a high honor for 
being both brave and stupid at the same time on that one. Uh, what was that mission? We were going in. Oops, what did I do with it? Maybe I. So, I, here it is. I think. We were going in. They were going to put a recon team into an area. And as the medal says, where no Americans were. And we're going to put this recon team in. And it was on April 27, 1967. We're escorting uh, 46s into an area to put in a recon team. Well, as soon as the recon team chopper started in, we made six, eight passes before that, and we actually did what they call flares, where you bring your chopper up like this and just kind of hover for a minute. And we didn't draw any fire. As soon as that big 46 come out of the sky way back when, it, got, it, it became Swiss cheese, and it went down in flames. Well, we got on our guns, and I had rearmed at an Army outpost. And as soon as we got on our shot off our rockets and that, we went to external guns, and they, every external gun jammed on my chopper and on the other chopper because we'd gotten bad ammo. So we're shooting the in, internal guns, and we ran out of ammo on them, and the Grunts and the 46 crew, they can't get them out, and they're surrounded. Well, I happen to carry an M79 grenade launcher, which is a nice little weapon to have. And I had several cases of ammo. And so the pilot went into what they called a little delta circle. And I was letting loose in the tree lines where they were drawing all the fire with my M79. And finally, they quit shooting, and the other 46 got in and back evacuated everybody but I to fire this thing accurately I actually had to stand out on the skids or sit on the rocket pod so I could shoot straight down and I was doing and my pilot's just Captain Cobb he was just having a basically a hoot and a holler having a good time <laughs> with me out there uh, well I'll get even with you later Captain but but I didn't even know he put me in for this until I got the award uh, but it was just a case of I didn't think it was just instinct Let's protect these guys. I have something here I can protect them with. Let me use them. Where is this area? That it, you're at well, now? technically, we're west of TACAN 69, which was a radio channel you flew off of over there. Mm -hmm. Different areas had different TACANs. And if you really figured it out, we were in Cambodia. But they say so many miles, and you say, yeah, okay. But then you figure out where Quezon is, and then you follow it out, and you say, whoops. Yeah. And we were probably six, eight miles into Cambodia. Now, is this Army units that you're protecting down there? Or no, this was, this was a Marine recon team at this time. Uh, we put a couple Army units in North Vietnam, and we protected them. Uh, above the caveat, which was the river between North and South Vietnam, we actually put this A-team several times. We flew out of Quezon and flew north, and they says, okay, this is where we want out at, and no questions asked, but we were in North Vietnam. So do you uh, land when you unload these men, or do they? We flare. Oh. Come in. We'd be coming in at maybe 80, 90 <clears throat> knots. Flare that bad boy, and I admired him. Get down to maybe five, ten knots, two, three feet off the ground, sometimes even the rear stinger would hit the ground, which protected the rear rotor, and they were gone. And the only way you knew they were gone is the helicopter would jump up because the you weight. just got rid of a whole bunch of weight. Yeah. And it was always fun working with them. And these are Army Special Forces men we're talking about yes. now? With them, it was always different working with them. Sometimes we'd put them in, and within an hour, they're calling us, come back, we got what we needed. And we'd go back, and they already had two or three prisoners, and we'd make a flare. They'd throw the prisoners in. They'd climb on the skids and hold on and then start climbing. I'd be yanking them in. My gunner would be yanking them in. And the other planes would be yanking them in, and we'd be gone again. But they were, they played hard. They lived hard. Uh, I liked working with them because 
you got the best of everything. Uh, there's an old saying amongst the Marine Corps is how so few can do so much with so little. And it's the truth. We, we scrounged stuff, we stole stuff, we begged, we borrowed. Uh, the Army would set a Huey down and put charges in it because it took a few hits and they had a hydraulic leak. And we'd know where it was, and before the charges went off, we'd land, patch up the hydraulic leak, throw the chargers out, and fly the bad boy out of there. Uh, and then we'd get it back to our base, and we'd strip out everything we could use. <laughs> uh, we actually, at one time, had an Air Force C-130 in a helicopter outfit. We borrowed that down at Tonsonet. We went in there to get some parts, and there was a C-130 sitting there. And we were talking, I was talking to a couple of Air Force guys, and they said, oh yeah, it took a few hits in the hydraulics, and pilots landed it, and the crew walked away from it, and we're not sure what they're going to do with it. Well, we got out what they called the blade tape, wrapped up the hydraulic lines real good, put, threw some hydraulic fluid in, we called our one pilot over, and he says, what do you think? He says, oh, it's firing a bad boy up. He fired it up, and worked the pedals and everything, he says, hydraulics are holding. He says, one of you guys need to be in the back there, though, in case it starts leaking to rewrap it. And we flew that thing from Tonsonet back to Quang Tree. And we came in using our squadron call sign, and the tower went nuts, like, wait a minute, you're a C-130. What are you using, a helicopter? But we figured, Air Force didn't need it, so we did. <laughs> and we used it to take some unofficial R&Rs to Thailand and Bangkok and that. How long did you keep the C-130? Oh, it was stolen when I left. Huh? It was still there when I left. <laughs> Anything we took stayed. When I left Vietnam, our outfit was supposed to have 24 helicopters, and we had 36, thanks to the Army. As soon as we bring one back, they'd paint it Marine Corps green, put on a bureau number, make up a bureau number, and it was ours. Uh, the older guys over there all had their own personal Jeeps that we stole from the Army and the Air Force. You know, we'd go somewhere and there'd be a couple of Jeeps sitting around. Damn, they must have abandoned that Jeep. Drive it back. The only thing we ever had to give back, our colonel made us give back a little Bell helicopter that some Air Force general flew in with, his personal little helicopter, and we stole it. And They had already had it painted. He was at a meeting in then Chow, and they already had it painted, our metal shop and that. And our colonel called us, four of us, at he knew who was, and he called us and he says, please return his helicopter. And I mean, he was, you know, please. Tell us about your crew members that you, did you serve with the same guys the whole two years <clears throat> that you were there? Some of the pilots, the pilots all were rotated in and out anywhere from six to 12 months. Uh, there was a group of enlisted, we all extended together, we got there, within a week or two of each other, and we all extended with each other. What were their names? You uh, had the nicknames, I know. Right? Shively, Ippolito, DeFeo, Muldrew, Crutcher, uh, Snyder, well, he got killed over there. Uh, but those were basically the guys we extended with. We were basically the guys that we ran the outfit. The officers knew it. The COs knew it. That whatever we wanted to do. <clears throat> Twice, I didn't get promoted, but I didn't get demoted. The one time I blew up the CO's Jeep, making a beer run. Hit a landmine. Well, yeah. He got a little pissed off because I, I was making a beer run for a promotional party for three of us. Well, he decided he wasn't going to promote me, but he didn't demote me. Were you hurt when you hit the landmine? I got thrown out and bruised. The only thing that was hurt was my ego. Yeah. The other time we blew up a Jeep, the only thing, we blew up the beer with it, <laughs> which we had gone to a Army area, and they had pallets of beer, and we stole a whole pallet of beer. Now, a pallet of beer had 144 cases. Okay. We stole the whole damn thing. And coming back, Crutch was driving, and we hit another mine of some kind. We got thrown clear, and all the beer got blown up. Now, that upset me. 
What base are you spending most of your time at then, or, or, or your headquartered at? Sort well, of? I was headquartered most of the time at a Quang Tree, which was up north. A few months in Quezon, a few months in Phubai, but most at a Quang Tree. Now at a Quang Tree, I was detailed to the Special Forces base outside of Quezon for five, four, five, six months. I was also detailed to sh out on a ship for off and on. Really? Yeah, flew off what they called LPHs. Landing helicopter platforms. They were actually now they're like modern ships, but the ones we were flying off of were old World War II box carriers. Mm -hmm. We flew off the Okinawa, the Oriskany, trying to, get, but they were the old concrete deck, wooden. They're box carriers. Mm -hmm. They sunk the Oriskany down in Florida, and used it for a reef barrier or something. Uh, like. Yeah, I, yeah, I flew off her quite often, and then we did fly off some LP, uh, some uh, LSDs and some uh, destroyer escorts where you just had a little postage stamp extended helicopter platform to land on. Now you're conducting normal your normal missions uh, when you're landing on these uh, carriers. It, it, yeah, some of it was medevac. Uh, usually when. Uh, you know, it, it all depended on what missions we were flying. Uh, usually when we were working off the ships, we were flying both combat and medevac missions because usually wherever the ships were, the, uh, God, I can't think of the name of it, it wasn't a hope, but there was a medical ship assigned to this group. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'd be escorting medevac birds in and out and up to that to the uh, medical ship and there was a German medical ship and an American medical ship that we used to you know fly our wounded to. Mm -hmm. Were you carrying a wounded or uh, at times it, it, it all sometimes it was a 34 sometimes it was a 53 or a 46 those were all different helicopters sometimes it was us. We were the baby. The 34s were old uh, sequoias that were from but before the Korean War, they were gas-driven. They sat up real high. They had big gas engines, and they could get shit blown at them, and they wouldn't go down. Then you had the 46s, which was an extended bird, two, two big blades on top. Then you had the 53, which we called the big bird, which was basically Sierra Rescue, and the Air Force had them, we had them, everybody. Uh, they were used for moving a lot of troops at once, or like us, on a good day, everything ideal, we could have four or five people on our bird besides the crew. 34s could carry 10 to 12, 15, the 46s could carry 10 to 20, and the 53s could carry 30, 40. Wow. So. What, uh, what motivated you to re-enlist? Or you mean, I mean extend uh, in extend, Vietnam? Extend, I'm sorry. Well, what they do is they give you your orders two months before you're due to come out of Vietnam. Well, I looked at my orders, and I was ordered to Camp Lejeune to become a drill instructor. Now, first of all, how many years did you sign up for to begin? Four. Four years. Yeah. Okay. All right, so now your orders say you're going to be a drill instructor. At Camp Lejeune, and I yeah. says, I don't want to be a drill instructor. I don't want to go back to being a grunt. I, you know, I'm into this, as I called it, the easy life. As, as the grunts referred to, I was an Airedale. Mm -hmm. So my buddies, they were getting their orders, and they were getting orders that they didn't like in locations they didn't like. And we were allowed to fill out what they called a dream sheet to get you stationed where you wanted to be, quote, come out of Vietnam. But so... I got my orders and I looked at them and I don't want to be a drill instructor. And I was talking to Crutch and I was talking to Ip and all them and they're saying, we don't want to go where they're sending us. So we all re-up re for another six months. And the next set of orders I got was to a place called Gross Eel, Michigan. You know, where the hell is Gross Eel, Michigan? You know, mm -hmm. it was a little island on the Detroit River. The bridge opened up at midnight so the river traffic could flow because they shut everything down. And if you weren't on base by midnight, you didn't get on base till 6 o'clock the next morning. So I kind of looked at them orders and I thought, well, I think I can live with these, but I don't know. Well, it was getting within 
six weeks of us being our orders coming due. And I don't know why we got a new flight surgeon. All of a sudden, he decided a bunch of us needed to go see some psychologists and some psychiatrists down in Da Nang. And we got down there, and we were like, well, we're going to make the best of this. We swapped name tags around, and 9 o'clock, lights out in the hospital ward. 9.15, we were out the back door under the fence, and we're in town drinking and partying all night. Well, this people down there decided we were basically wacko. And they listed us combat fatigue, unfit for combat duty. So none of us could re-up again for another six months. So we had no choice but to go to wherever our orders sent us. And so you uh, went to Gross Isle? I see. Um, any of your uh, any of your guys and your crew go with you? Or no, I was the only one there. It was, a, it was a little reserve base. When I got there, there was two C-119s there, two UH or two H-34s there, which were the uh, gas-driven choppers. And I says, why did they send a jet mechanic here when I don't know nothing about these aircraft? And I was talking to a sergeant up there that lived in a little farther up in Ohio. And he says, well, I'll teach you about the C-119s. They were the old flying box cars. Right. Well, I was there about a week and a half, and we flew a few missions, cross countries and those. And all of a sudden, one morning, we wake up, and everybody's packing crates of tools and stuff up. And they're putting them on these 34s and 19s. What's going on? We got orders out of here. I said, wait a minute, I didn't get any orders. And there was like maybe 12 of us that had something to do. I knew a few of them from other squadrons in Vietnam, but we w worked on jet helicopters. A couple of them were 46 people, hydraulic people, and this, that, and the other. Well, all of a sudden, there goes two-thirds of our base, and we're left. And I'm thinking, what's going on? Well, a couple days later, this OV-10 comes in. Bronco. Oh, what the? I'm looking, I'm saying, okay, that's really nice. What is it? Well, the guy gets out and he's a tech rep, and another one lands and it's got a tech rep in. He says, You're getting four of these up here. I said, Oh, that's nice. And they leave, and there's airplanes sitting there. And we have nothing to pull it in the hangar with, nothing. It just has to sit there because we're not equipped for it. And a few of us there. Next day, they come back. They bring another one. Well, we finally got four of them. Our CO then was a, believe it or not, was a captain. And he was a, worked in a supply. He knew nothing about flying. He had no wings or nothing. He could care less. We had a phone number to call him if we needed him. He never even came to base. Our EXO was a first lieutenant who did have wings, but he wanted to hang out with the Navy because they had big, real jets. So all of a sudden we got these OV-10s and they decide, well, you four guys, Pete, you're senior, you three, you're the crew chiefs. Okay. Well, then this tech rep says, well, you got to know something about this thing. I may as well take you up and show you around the air. What did it do? The first clue, I should have known something was wrong. He was in a G suit, and I'm just in a regular old cloth flight suit. We're getting this bad boy, and we're cutting holes in the sky in Michigan out over the lake and stuff. And that's when he says, you want to fly it? I says, Not really. He says, well, bubble lift. I says, no. I flew helicopters. He said, well, take the controls. Well, knowing helicopters, you fly three degrees, nose down. That's how you go through the sky. I'm on the controls, he puts me three degrees nose down, or I put a three degrees nose down, and we're dying. I mean, we're coming out of the sky like a, a, at a hawk making an attack on something. Well, then I pull it back, and we go up in the air, and we go this way, and we're just, you know, finally I get the thing flying level. He says, okay, I got it. I'm going to show you what this thing's going to do. Now, what engines are on this plane? They're a jet engine, but I don't know what particular engine it was. It was a twin Prop jet. So you had twin engines, but props drove them. And so he starts doing barrel rolls in this thing. 
Then he does a couple hammer heads, they call them, where they go up, stall out, and you fall over back. And then he comes screaming out of the sky, and I was redding out. I mean, it's just a case of without a G-suit, everything starts getting red and compact. I had enough sense that I remembered I started yelling real loud, and I grabbed the oxygen line and hooked it to my helmet where I was getting some oxygen. I never went completely out, which amazed him. And as hard as he tried, he could never make me get sick. But then, you know, then I became a fixed wing person. But my prefer was always the UH-1. Now, uh, we never did discuss the uh, engines in the UH-1. Uh, it was a jet engine. Right down here on Seymour, there's a big building on your right. That used to be a General Electric building, and that's where they built them. Uh, okay. When we used to get these engines in Vietnam, they were in a big can, and you take them out of the can when you had to replace an engine that got shot up or something. And I'd always see the thing, you know, built at such and such West Seymour. So when the old engine was going home, I always put a note in, help them being held captive <laughs> and stuff like that. So, I don't know if they ever got my notes back or not, but, you know, it was... How many engines did the UH-1 have? One. One. Uh, as the old saying went, as long as that big fan on top would spin, you could always land safe. It's when it quit spinning, you had a problem. We landed hard a few times, but, you know. Now, did it run off of... Uh, jet fuel. Jet fuel. JP-4. Okay. But it could run off of av gas if it was an emergency and you had to make a setting on a fuel meter because mm -hmm. I take it av gas burns a lot hotter and whatever but uh, we had a club in our outfit in Vietnam it was called the 100 hit club it means your chopper took 100 hits wow well I guess it was 15 or 20 missions before I got in my buddy Crutch got in in one mission and a couple other guys got in in one mission. I mean, it was amazing what those Hueys and 34s could get take and keep flying. And you had men there repairing them every evening when they come back or every day when they come back? Well, in. some days, yes. Some days, no. I mean, some days you, you landed and all you had to do was clean them up, refuel them, rearm them, and they were good. Other days you came in, you had to get what they called blade tape, which was like an aluminum duct tape, and you smacked that on the bullet holes. And paint them green. Is that right? Uh, as long as a vital, as I call them organs, but a vital part of the plane didn't get hit. And a Huey, most of it's air. You know, the tail boom, there's just a couple vital things in it. Uh, as long as the rotor head, and the even if the blades got hit, if you could patch them, you did. But as long as nothing, you know, vital got hit, you just patch them up and fly them. I forgot to ask you, were any of the men on uh, uh, on your crew ever wounded? Or Yes. I had a gunner shot up, and I had a co-pilot take a hit. Uh, I got hit, but I didn't take credit for that hit. I got shot by my buddy Crutcher. His guns jammed. We're doing all the shooting on my side. Well, he pulls out his forty-five and... I got my leg propped up like this so I can stand up on my machine gun like this. He opens up. First shot went under my leg. The second shot hit me right there. Went clean through the muscle, came out the other side. I'm yelling, I'm hit. Captain Cobb was our pilot, and he turns around and says, really nice job, Crutch. Thank God that gun jammed. And, you know, it was one of these deals. Well, you want to, I know you our outfit never you never took a cheap purple heart and that would have been considered yeah. cheap because the next one you got yeah. was given to your family it was yeah. a superstition but it worked uh we went in corman looked at me and says it's clean through he dumped some alcohol on it and peroxide put a couple gauze pads on it taped it off and says, there you're well to this day every time i see crutch i remind him i still owe him one what's crutch's for full name uh robert crutcher uh, and he lives here in Cincinnati? Well, I ain't sure where he's living right now. He was living in Florida. He came home for a while. He used to live up here. He came home for a while. Then he bought an RV, and I ain't heard from him since, except occasionally I get an email. Uh, so I think him and his wife are living a good life touring the, 
touring America. Yeah. Um, so after your flight in the uh, OB-10, was it? Yeah. Um, That's oh, my wife. She's oh. just having a night tear. She <laughs> has those. Everything's okay. Yeah. Um, go on with your story after you land with the OB-10 with well, the tech rep. Well, from then on, it was just, you know, it got to the point any time a pilot back in the world here, back in the United States, up in Michigan, came in to learn to fly. I had to fly with him. So I flew to the OV-10. I flew in him. I didn't love him. I didn't like him. I was stuck with him. If I would have had my way, I would have been happy to go somewhere where they had Hueys. But, you know, I learned to well, we went to a lot of places. We'd take off and just go someplace because a pilot would come in and need his flight time for the weekend. And we'd climb in that thing, and we might fly to Rosie Roads down in Puerto Rico, or we might fly down to Gitmo in Cuba. So they had open water time plus cross-country time. And Of course, when we went into them places, we went into Cuba, we always seemed to find several cases of cigars to put in the tail boom on them because they had twin tail booms like the old P-51s. Yeah. Or when we went into Puerto Rico, you could put actually get four cases of rum on each tail boom. Now, drug a little bit, but you know, they'd stay there nicely and you get back through customs with them. And, you know, it's, basically we were doing the same thing as we did in Huey's in Vietnam of scrounging and borrowing and begging. But I like doing it in the Hueys a lot more because I carried captain spars. I was the, in our outfit. I was the head scrounge officer. If the outfit needed something, we wore no rank over there. So I put the cotton bar on my hat, and we might go to an Air Force base and confiscate a pallet of beer or confiscate a whole bunch of marsh matting, which is what they made the runways and that out over there confiscate rolls and rolls of screens so we could put around our hut. Cause this is in the United States we're talking no, about. No, no, this is in hut. Vietnam. Oh, you're back in Vietnam. Yeah, I'm this, sorry. this, over there I was the head scrounge officer and our outfit. And like I say, we scrounged everything from airplanes. And you're wearing captain's bars on your... Nobody's questioning it because they, they see us come in in a Huey or they see us drive up and... We found out if you had bars on, the Air Force, the Army, the Seabees, they never asked who you were. They just considered you were an officer because you were in a flight suit. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know who you are or what you did. And so be it. They, you know, you say, well, I, I laugh because years later I saw these things of mesh and the stuff they were doing there. Yeah. And I swear to God they stole that from our outfit. We had our own still. We found out that you can drink grain alcohol that the corpsmen used to get in 55-gallon drums. Well, we would swap a corpsman some hours flying with us at night and stuff, and he'd get us a 55-gallon drum of grain alcohol, and we'd mix it with orange Kool-Aid and call it a, a screwdriver. We'd mix it with lemon Kool-Aid, and it would become something else. But once we found out you could drink this stuff, it was kind of... It was kind of neat and bad both because <laughs> we flew drunk a few times. We also found out if you were drunk and you got the corpsman to give you a shot of vitamin B and you got some pure oxygen, you could fly your mission. But when that wore off, you had the worst hangover in the world. I mean, I cannot describe how painful that hangover was. Uh, like I say, yeah, pure oxygen had a way of sobering you up real quick. Uh, like I say, we we had a few Air Force. Uh, it was a, some O2s were sent up to our outfit in Vietnam, and a couple of O1s, and they were on the other side of the base. And well, they had it made. They had hot water heaters and air conditioned trailers. Not to knock the Air Force, but those guys had it made. Well. During Tet, they pulled all the Air Force guys out of our base. Well, as far as we we're concerned, they abandoned everything on their side. We didn't know if they were coming back ever. Birds were all gone. People were all gone. 
we went over and we got the trailers and the hot water heaters and the Jeeps and the truck, everything they had, <laughs> air condition, trailers. And what they, we did is the Seabees dug trenches and we put the trailers in the trench and then we brought, they, the Seabees did, we didn't, brought up these big air intakes so they could suck in fresh air for the air conditioners and throw out the hot air. And air Force eventually came back and it was like, where's our base? Sorry guys, must have gotten blown up. <laughs> because things did get blown up. Our hut, hut got blown up four times. We actually, after the second time, painted a big red bullseye on our hut, on the roof. Our CO says, you can't do that. We had this goofy sergeant major was strictly marine life material. He says, well, they're gonna shoot. I says, they already shoot at it. Our hut's on it, what they call an aiming stake. And we says, you know, twice our hut got blown up in two weeks. Well, hooch they were called, really. And it was like, so what if we put a target on it? Who gives a rats? You know. Our hooch was made of nothing but screen, some two by fours to hold the screen up, and a wooden floor. So, you know, this, and a, a roof, you know. This way we could get out of it in a hurry, we could run through the screen, and, and it was nothing solid that was gonna, you know, they were going to rebuild because it was, like I say, ours got blown up four times. Uh, me and Crutch and Ippolito were kidding the officers the one time it got blown up. There was this big crater and water filled in it. And we said, well, look, we got a swimming pool to you guys. And they just look at us like we were nuts and kind of leave us go. And we got in trouble with one fourth of July for shooting off uh, flares. You know, the enemy can find you. The enemy knows where we're at. Come on, people. You know, the enemy works on this base in the daytime and then shoots us at us at night. You know, jumping back to that hospital where you guys... Uh, oh, down to Nang? Yeah. Um, what happened to the guys that you were with there? What did We all got shot, sent back to our outfit, and then we were all... That every one of us went home. I see. It was just... That was the main hospital. Uh, you had Delta Med, Charlie Med, Alpha and Bravo Med. Those were like you saw in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Patch them up and get them to the, the main hospital or the hospital ship. That's basically where we flew in all our injured to those different meds. Uh, our outfit had a flight surgeon attached to us and two corpsmen, which are you call doc. Mm -hmm. I don't care what their names were, they were docked, period, stop, end uh -huh. of sentence. If you ask them what they were, they were Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you got used to flying people into these other meds, just getting them out, and then you might come back a day or two later, and how was so-and-so we brought in? Well, he didn't make it or he did make it. I actually, a kid I went to high school with here in Cincinnati, I medevaced him in, and I didn't recognize him, but he recognized me, and it was like, whoa, you know, and he didn't make it. Uh, DI I had in boot camp was back in Vietnam, and I medevaced him, and I did recognize him, and we were talking. Well, I carried every helicopter. Was, uh, our CO required us we carry four canteens of water, one for each person. In case we went down, we got water. Well, I carried six. The two spares were full of Jack Daniels or grain alcohol. And if they didn't have a belly wound or a bad head wound, I'd always say, you want a shot? And they'd look at me. I got away with that for several months till a pilot one day went over to grab a canteen. And I was not at the bird, and I just saw him grabbing it. He uncapped it, <laughs> and all of a sudden it was like, you know, wide-eyed, and, and he yells. All I could remember is him yelling, Harris, you rang? <laughs> what is it? I said, it's Jack Daniels, so pretty good, ain't it? <laughs> he just shook his head and says, no wonder you people do weird shit. He, he had just been new into the outfit. Uh, we were allowed to haze new pilots. We were given permission by our colonel if a new pilot come in and screwed up, 
we could haze the hell out of them, do stupid shit. Uh, new pilots had to learn to help clean up a helicopter. And if they got sick in it, guess what? They had to clean it up. Not, not me, but them. Uh, me and Crutch and a couple of the other guys, we could get on target with our machine guns in five rounds or less. We bragged about that. But we could also manipulate our machine guns where we were blowing hot brass down a new pilot's neck. And they'd be bitching because their back got burnt and they'd be squirming. But like I said, we did a lot of things to the pilots over there, a lot of goofy stuff. Uh, we're flying with a new, new co-pilot and an old pilot. I put on my gunner's belt, which let you go out 20 feet. If you fell, you could fall 20 feet. Well, I'm crawling up the skid underneath the pilot, and all of a sudden Crutch yells, enemy tank, enemy tank, and they bank. And then Crutch screams, Pete fell out, Pete fell out. And I, I'm holding on, and this bird's going like this, where the pilot and the co-pilot are trying to see where I landed in the rice paddies, if I'm dead or not, and I knocked on the bubble underneath. That didn't make them happy. We laughed, but that didn't make them happy. I can't do you. And I says, okay, well, that was a good one. Uh, flying with Captain Price, we went in on a mission. And when we went out, I saw this hut sitting next to a bomb crater that had water in it. Well, we're coming back. The hut's on the other side of the crater. And I says, wait a minute. And I says something to Denny. I says, Captain Price, Captain Denny, he says, what? I says, you remember that hut? Yeah. Did it move? He says, so we decide we bank around, come in, make a gun run on it. <clears throat> he opens up with the 60s. The tracers are hitting this this hut and they're ricocheting. Now, wait a minute. Tracers don't ricochet off of straw huts. All of a sudden, this tank comes rumbling out, and his gun starts coming up, and it's like, oh, shit, let's get out of here. Wow. Anything we carried on out here, he couldn't hurt a tank. <laughs> yes. Let's call in the big boys. And we called, and uh, there's three AD-1 Sky Raiders on station. Uh, an AD-1 Sky Raider is an old World War II, Korean War, prop-driven. Uh, you being an Air Force man, you probably know. They carried the world in ammunition. They could fly all day, and their idea of making gun runs or bomb runs were 50 feet or lower half the time. And God love them, and we did. Well, they come over, and we told them what they had, and one guy says, I'm going to get him with my 50, and he rolls in and says, 350s on each wing open up. You see the rounds, the, uh, the AT rounds hitting and exploding. You see the tracers hitting and ricocheting. <laughs> so his buddy comes in and says, I got a 500 pounder. He put it right down this guy's tube. And we had to give him a probable kill. We couldn't find enough of it left to say it was confirmed. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was like, we'll give you a probable and we don't know how many people because we ain't found enough to identify it as a tank. And the Air Force guy says, I'll take that. Like I say, we had a good working relationship with them. Uh, B-57 jocks, we had a good relationship with, of course, our own Marine Corps fighters and Navy fighters. The biggest nightmare over there was the B-52s. <clears throat> they would do what they called an arc light, and that's where the word rolling thunder came from. There'd be a lead and one off each wing so far. God knows how many bombs they can carry. But they'd come over, and they wouldn't even announce when they were making these arc lights. And the reason they call them arc lights, because at night, it just lit up like uh, northern lights. I mean, you know, miles and miles away you could see them. Well, there was more than once. We were in the cone of an arc light. And didn't even know it until they started dropping. All of a sudden, the bombs are going off on one side and the other side. And we're hoping and praying that the lead bird is out there and not, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was, and you really don't know which way you should turn. Like I said, I have no idea how many bombs a B-52 can carry. All I can tell you is a whole hell of a lot. So anytime you got caught in that, I had the pleasure of working with the New Jersey, a battleship. Mm-hmm. Uh, we called for naval gun one day, and we'd bring in naval gunfire. Well, usually you gave them a 1,000-meter coordinate square and then corrected. 
Well, we called, we got this call sign we'd never heard of, and I'm working the pad and back. I'm saying, okay, blah, 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 and I'm giving them coordinates. I give them six digit, and they said, no, we want 10 digit. That's a 10 square meter. And I says, I can't remember, I think Rosenthal was my pilot. I says, Lieutenant, what do you think? He says, give them what they want, Pete. So I give them a 10 square meter. And I'm thinking, come on, Navy, I've worked with you. You're lucky if you can get a 1,000 square meter. All of a sudden, we see these three, it looked like, Volkswagen's coming through the sky. They fired 2,000 pound projectiles. That's what the battleships fired. And they had their own slipstream. All of a sudden, this area we're looking at, boom, it's gone. And they says, we're firing for effect. And it was an island that had some uh, quad 50s and other stuff on. Well, we backed off a little bit and they worked out probably for 20, 25 minutes and it was no longer an island. All it was was a muddy spot in the ocean. But I had never seen anything like that in our lives, so we asked where they were at, and they were actually just about three miles out. So mm -hmm. us, we're talking, go, we're gonna fly out and see what these things are. Those guns look so big, it looked like you could fly down them. Now how far were you away from the target area that they were firing? Well, when they first opened up, we were about 200 yards. In the air? In the air and about 50 yards 200 yards away, 50 yards up. It was like, let's get the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> we had that tr a lot. We had that problem quite a lot where we had our noses where they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, I shot down an Air Force F4. We told the guy, they're making their gun runs. We told him, pull out to the right. First one went in, he pulled out to the right, here comes his wingman in, he pulls off to the left. Well, we're already climbing all over our machine guns, you know, just outside where their bombs hit, and he pulls out right into my gun, and I, I knock. You didn't intentionally shoot him? I didn't intentionally no, shoot him, no. but he was very upset with me. Did he live? Oh, we, we picked up both him and his, his rear. F-4 is a F-14, yeah. Or F-14 or F-4? F-4, F-4 to yeah, Phantom. Yeah. The Phantom, yeah. Yeah, and we picked up his rear and him. He wasn't real happy with us. Well, he says, hey, fool, you're the one that went the wrong way. It wasn't us. And then, of course, anytime we pick up a pilot, we'd ho hold him hostage for ransom. And I don't think he was too well liked because when we called down to Nanang and said, we got this captain and this major, blah, blah, this, we were told to keep him. We says, no, all we want is a case of Jack Daniels, 25 gallons of ice cream, 10 cartons, five cartons of a menthol cigarette, and five cartons of Camel, regular, and you get them back. Well, you can keep them. <laughs> we told this guy, and he says, no, I says, here, you get on the radio down to the Nang and talk to your squadron. They don't want you. Now, I don't know if they were just kidding or if they didn't like this guy, but we never had a any pilot we rescued, where well, they refused to <laughs> ransom him, and they flat out said no. And another thing, when we had the pilots, they were our slaves until they got ransomed, so they had to, you know, help clean the Hueys, wash them down, clean up around the area and stuff. It was all in good nature. How often did you uh, have, are involved in rescuing uh, pilots? Uh -huh. Oh, a couple times. Uh, I'd say a week. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We'd actually, when we were in Quang Tree, we would fly in North Vietnam to pick them up there. Naval pilots or Air Force? Anybody. Anybody. Anybody that went down, we went after, even the Arvins, because the Arvins flew with the Air Force, the AD-1s or A-1Ds, whatever. But uh, yeah, we would go get them, no matter who they were. We didn't care. There was times that the Air Force, with their 53s and that, they refused to go because it was at night or it was rainy or... I, we flew with a bunch of pilots and crew members that were totally screwed up. We flew in any weather, we flew at night and that was long before night goggles and stuff like that where we would fly by the glow of the moon or the 
whatever, or just knowing the terrain. And that's why my squadron that I was in was so well known over there and liked over there because they knew if we were called for, we'd be there. Uh, it got so that the Army was constantly calling for us because we would be there. So we, there was a thing on a rear tail rotor hung above the line shack, and it said, through these doors walk the most effed up fighter pilots in the world because we flew at any time. Uh, games we used to play is see who can fly lowest to the, the hooch out in the middle of nowhere without hitting it. And we'd come back in with a straw in our intakes from where we were flying so low and doing shooting and that and you know stuff would blow up. I came back in several times. One time I didn't think we were going to make it back because the hydraulics were going out. But we went in and my buddy Crutcher's plane's coming in behind us and he's firing. And his shrapnel actually came up and damaged my helicopter. Mm. And his whole quote was, you shouldn't have been there. <laughs> of course, he worked all night with me to get the damn thing back up. Did you, uh, did you ever work with any of the South Vietnamese? Um, with uh, some of their troops and some of their pi the pilots that flew the, the mm -hmm. old Sky Raiders, you know, the mm -hmm. prop jobs that flew with the Air Force. We worked with them. We did work with some of their troops. Uh, we preferred not to. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked with Korean troops. Loved them. They were the meanest little devils I'd ever seen in my life. If we went in to get fuel with them, I'd watch these guys pick up 55-gallon drums of jet fuel mm -hmm. and carry them over to our chopper. Uh, we worked with some Australians, and I made the mistake there of calling them limeys. You don't call an Australian a limey. They make it very clear. And it was a, it was a hell of a fight that night. <laughs> Between them, the special forces, and us, yeah. Everybody was half drunk up. Uh, I got pierced ears. Mm -hmm. uh, my first piercing was done before piercing was cool. I was living with a mountain yard with the special forces. And they're having some kind of celebration one night. And I'm never had it before. I'm drinking rice wine. And I do not remember half of the night. I'm going to be honest, truthful. I woke up the next morning. I turned my head and this thing smacked me. And it's a big brass hoop earring with paint on it, different colors. I was adopted into their tribe. And by adopting me in, I had a bracelet and the piercing. Well, then I found out how they did the piercing. They got the earring melting hot and went through your ear with it. With the earring itself. Right. And how big was this? It was a hoop about that big. Uh huh. And then the, then the, the one on my wrist, but that identified me as a tribe member of theirs. You don't recall the Special Forces outfit you were with, do you? Like I say, no. I just remember a cowboy and a few of the other guys. They were stationed outside of Quezon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was just one of those deals where we got sent up with them, me and Crutch, and the neat thing up there was they had more booze than they had water. We actually would brush, up, brush our teeth to save water with beer. Mm -hmm. Probably know, better for you. They, 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 <laughs> they could get everything. I tell you, these guys had it. We did pull one job on them, and they didn't believe we did it. An M60 machine gun, the grunts in that are trained five, six round bursts so you don't melt the barrel. Well, with a Huey and that big fan upstairs, once you climb on that gun, you just stay on it and the air cools it off. Well, they got hit one night, and their 150 and their 160 got taken out. So they got a big area that's not covered. And me and Crutch are talking, talking with the pilots, and all of a sudden this one pilot says, well, hell, we can fill that gap. He air-taxied the Huey over and just was hovering, 
and that gave them four M60s, two on each side, and 24 rockets on each side. There's firepower on that gap. And these guys thought it was crazier than hell because, you know, they saw us open up with our 60s and they're saying, you're gonna melt, we ain't gonna melt the barrels as long as that fan's blowing. And we also carry, you know, spare barrels. And in all the gun runs we made over there where we'd go through thousands of rounds at one gun run, I never melted a barrel. Uh, give you an idea what a Huey carried. It could carry 18 rockets, 24 rockets, 36 rockets, or 48, depending on the rocket pack. In other words, you had nine on up on each side, up to 24 on each side. You had, my bird had two M60s on each side, and the M60s inside, and everything else I carried in the belly. My buddy's crutcher's bird had what they called a tack, which was an M60 in the nose of his chopper, besides his other stuff. But he couldn't carry as much ammunition as I could, because he had a different type of, he had what they called a 540 rotor head on his Huey, I had a 204, and 204 could lift more than a 540. And the casings just go off into the... Into the, into the cockpit, into the here, out of, out of the bird. You never knew where they were going to go. Yeah. Uh, the only thing you knew is every time you fired a rocket, if you had enough sense and you could, you looked away because there was always shrapnel coming out of that rocket when it went out the tube. You know, and when I first got home, I would always, all of a sudden, my wife would say, what's going on? I'd have the little bumps coming up, I'd squeeze, and a piece of metal would come out of my mm. arm. But, uh, and then I'd also carried anywhere from 12 to 20 more rockets inside my chopper, depending on the mission. And each external gun had 2,500 rounds in it, and I'd carry another 10,000 rounds so I could rearm while we were still in the air so I wouldn't have to land. Uh, basically, a Huey was a, a flying gun platform. What was the cockpit uh, made out of? Fiberglass, or uh, plexiglass. Plexiglass. Uh, the pilots did have bulletproof seats, but there was a little bit of tin on each side. And you had, above you, was what they called the greenhouse. It was green plexiglass. You had the windshield, and then you had the bubbles. And you had a little piece of aluminum that came down that these things joined into. And it was, that was it. Not much protection. No. No. Uh, let's just say they gave us flak jackets, but you may as well, if you did anything with it, you sat on it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't stop nothing, those flak jackets. Some of the pilots wore what they call 50 cal bullet bouncers. Damn stuff was inch and a half, two inches thick, weighed 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're, okay, they're sitting down, they'd put this on, but you know, after an hour or two, they had to take it off because they're starting to go like this with the damn things. Right. And I had a 50 cal in back and I sat on because I didn't want to lose my... Now, the pallet and co-pallet had uh, bulletproof seats? Yeah. What about you guys in the back? Oh, we had canvas seats. You know, I don't know if that picture shows it or not that I gave you. But the back... The back here is open, you see? Yes. And there's just a canvas seat right here you sit on. And this is your... That, that was the small rocket pack. Those were only nines. And this is uh, what caliber? Uh, seven, uh, yeah, M uh, M60, 7.62. That was the international NATO round back then. Mm -hmm. But... And this is the cockpit that we're talking yeah. about? Yeah, you see it's green here. Right. This window slides up, but it's just plexiglass, and everything's plexiglass. And then you got this as fiberglass, where the radios aren't in underneath here. There, that's all where plexiglass. Where's the jet engine at on this? Sitting behind this rotor head up here. The engine, all it did was turn the rotor. There was no thrust from the engine. The only thing that engine was good for besides turning the rotor is some guys in metal shop made some baskets up that we could hook up there, and we could put our sea rations in to heat them up. But, you know, everybody, oh, you had a jet engine. Well, a helicopter has no thrust. The only thing that makes you fly is the rotor head. Uh, we used to discuss at night when we got somebody new in a chopper with us why a helicopter should not fly. 
technically a helicopter cannot fly. It can ground, however, because the air is hitting the ground. Mm -hmm. But after you get up to a certain point past the ground hover, helicopter technically should not fly. And like I say, we would get a, another pilot from a fixed wing outfit flying with us just for the fun of it or whatever, and we'd start talking about this stuff. Uh, another thing we used to like to do is when we started taking fire, if we had some grunts in the bird, they always dove on the floor, so we'd stand on top of them. And I'll never forget this one guy says, why are you standing on me? I says, because you're laying down, right? Yeah. I says, which way do the bullets come? Up. <laughs> we had a marine recon team we worked with all the time, and there was a canine with that. Well, that canine adopted me and my helicopter. Soon as we'd land, there could be four, five, six, ten Hueys land. He'd come charging out, jump up in the back of my chopper and lay down on the seat. And he'd just lay there till we went on the mission. So his handler was always in my chopper with me and we had more fun with that shit. How do you pronounce that? That's Kehaw. Kehaw. That was our, this, this was the person that took this picture. Somehow he inserted that. And uh, that was the first base I was at. When VMO6 got to Vietnam, they started Da Nang, they moved up to Chu Ai, which was a fixed wing base. And after a few weeks later, they moved up to Kehaw, and that's when I was getting to Vietnam, so that's when I joined up. At one time, as you see here, this was all pretty and green and looking brand new. This was taken five, six months after the helicopter got put in service and <laughs> kind of looks beat up. Uh, on the nose, there was patches on the plexiglass where bullets had come through. Right here was a patch by the number 20 where a bullet had come through. And what they were doing is they were shooting at my co-pilot because he had a white helmet on. And they missed him and it, you know, damn near got me. Uh, and you would be sitting right yeah, here. Yeah, that was my area. Mm -hmm. All sitting, kneeling, standing, standing out, sitting on these, these two guns. I kind of, wherever I needed to be, I got to. You, you learn to be there. Your gunner, you just hoped your gunner could take care of the plane on his side, clear the guns, take care of the rockets if they needed, something was needed. Uh, <clears throat> I got lucky, my buddy Crutcher, he flew as my gunner quite often before he got his own chopper. Uh, I would fly as his gunner at times. Usually if we were flying nights, and I flew a lot of night missions, he would fly as my gunner for me. And the pilots enjoyed that because they knew they had two experienced people back there. I actually had pilots come in and there'd be birds out and something would happen and be an emergency launch for more birds. And Yet I was already told I was standing down for the rest of the day because I had flown 10, 12, 16 hours already. And they said, you're down for at least four hours. And I actually had pilots come in and tell me, we're going. It's, and they come in, it's 20 up. And they said, yeah. And they said, Pete, we're going. And I flew missions. Instead of being in my flight suit, I was in cutoffs, which what they called Ho Chi Minh sandals, which were a, uh, they were sandals made out of old tires. Right. I'd have those on. I'd have a pair of cutoffs on. I have a T-shirt that had, one of them was Snoopy on his doghouse giving everybody the bird, and, you know. There was times, and this one pilot we had, we called him Smiley McAdams. He never smiled. We had an emergency launch. The emergency standby birds were there, and he says, no, I want 20. And I was sitting there. I already had, somehow that night, we got like three beers, and I had grabbed my fifth of Jack Daniels, and I was, I was told I wasn't going to fly till 8 o'clock the next morning. And I was, I was gone. I was so I go out and I get in the bird and we turn up and we go. We're in a good shoot em up for the better part of four hours. We come back in, I get out of the bird and he gets out and he looks at me and says, that's a hell of a uniform you got on. I said, sir, I wasn't supposed to go nowhere. Now I'm starting to sober up. And there is nothing worse than being in a shoot em up with a hangover. And he just looked and shook his head and he walked in and you have a sheet you fill out on a bird after every mission. He wrote, 
excellent bird, handled good, blah, blah, blah. We went through 15,000 rounds of ammo, 48 rockets, this, that, and the other. And the crew chief looked like shit. <laughs> he put that <laughs> on an after action report, huh? And I looked at it and I just shook my head. Well, Crutcher had one where his bird was light in the rear. He missed the flight. Took off and he, he missed it. He was somewhere else. And <laughs> about an hour later, they come back and the pilot says, yeah, he says, this bird flew good except for it was light in the rear. And Crutch is light in the rear. How do we fix that? Yeah, pilot looks at him and says, try getting your ass in the bird the next time. Uh, my buddy Crutch, he was called Magnet, Magnet Button. I went on an R&R &R to Hawaii to see my wife. I had just gotten my bird, new, new rotors, new blades. I mean, it was, you know, and I thought, okay, it's going to sit for a week. Nobody's going to fly it. It'd be good. I come back from Hawaii. And I'm walking across the line, all of a sudden I look up and there's, there's my baby sitting there. She's looking like Swiss cheese. I'm going, what the hell? I look over and there's Crutcher's bird. It's looking like Swiss cheese. Here he comes skipping out. I got something to tell you. I says, what? He says, well, I got all shot up and my co-pilot got hit and my gunner got hit. And we needed to get back out. And my bird just limped back in, so I jumped in yours. He went out in mine, got it all shot up. Then he jumped in another guy's bird. Got it half shot up. I looked at him. Yeah, I called him a whole bunch of names, and it wasn't a nice guy. <laughs> well, we worked from the time I got back. It was like 4 in the afternoon or something. Till 4 o'clock the next morning, we got my bird patched up, ready to fly. We got his bird patched up, ready to fly. And it was like, okay, let's see what we can do now. So the pilots come out, and they test flew them. We always had to make the test flight with them. Well, this particular test flight, as he, the pilot was turning up, you know, I'm standing there, I give him the turn up, and... He's shaking his head, everything's good, and I'm looking and seeing everything's good, and I give him the thumbs up, and I go. And he looks at me. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I see this. And I walk up, and says, sir? And it was Captain Kumpfeld. I says, sir? He says, what was that all about? I says, you realize I worked on that plane all night, it's fly. I think it's the engine and everything's working, but I don't know if it's going to fly. So I was just wishing you luck and telling you to go ahead and take it on the test flight, and I'd be here when you got back. Get your ass in the bird. <laughs> uh, another one of our favorite tricks was <laughs> we disconnect the cyclic stick, which, you know, how you fly the bird. Over here, you had the power and that, and in here, well, we disconnect this on the co pilot side. It was just one big bolt. We get him with a new test pilot. He'd go up and we're flying around a little bit. He said, okay, you got the stick? And I said, yeah, I got it. What do you want me to do with it? Watch the look on their face. I want to shut it off a second. Well, like I said, we would disconnect the cyclic and watch these pilots. You could just see the color drain out of their faces as you're holding up one of the control mechanisms. Or our other favorite trick was we knew certain pilots didn't pre-fly the bird real good. And the mass retaining nut sat on top. That's what it said. It retained the blades where the mass went up through the blades and then this nut come down and held the rotor in place. Well, we get a spare one. And we know these pilots didn't inspect the bird real good. And we'd take off and all of a sudden grab the retaining nut, start flipping up in the air and say, Sir, we got a problem. I said, Now, as long as we're flying, that that rotor's going to stay there because it's pushing down. But when we go to land, we got a problem. You'd hold up this mass retaining nut. And it was like, oh, shit, now what do we do? <laughs> you know, and you see them sitting in a cockpit trying to stretch to see. And you can't see this thing. It's up on top, and it's, you know, spinning. And <laughs> you sit there and kind of laugh at them. Like I say, pilots, officers were fair game. Uh, new ones were even fairer game. We had a reservist get promoted to captain, Kimu Andrews, and his nickname was Crash. 
now, and that might explain a lot. Well, he got promoted to captain. We had a party for him. We're drunk on our ass. We get an emergency launch the next morning. They're waking us up. It's dark. We go running out to get in the pop chopper. Co-pilot comes running out, and I'm not even thinking. Crutcher decided he's got a gun with me because we lived in the same hooch. I grabbed him. Uh, this one co-pilot, we kidded because he had a stick figure drawing of a Huey on his knee pad, and that's how he did his pre-flight. You know, two blades, two blades, this, that, and the other. We taxied all the way out to the arming area, and we get out to arm the rockets. And all of a sudden, Crutcher's waving at me. I'm like, what, what? And he's pointing, I'm, what? And I look down, son of a, we ain't got rocket pods. They had dropped our rocket pods the night before because they were gonna put the bigger ones on. Well, we climb back in the bird and Crutch says to the co-pilot, he says, you pre-flighted, right? Yeah. Crutch says, your drawing? Yeah. He says, do your drawing show we don't have rocket pods? And, I can't even remember who, the, it might have been Cranley, but he looks over at the co-pilot and says, Jesus Christ, he said, well, we got to go anyway, just with guns. Luckily, it was just a semi-hot mission, we just needed guns, the other, the other Huey with us had the big pods so he could work out on them, but we got back in and my head's hurting, crutch. and so the co-pilot's jumping on me about us not having rock, I says, wait a minute, you're supposed to pre-flight the bird the same as I do. And I says, I pre flight it the night before and make sure everything's ready to go. You're supposed to check and make sure everything's ready to go in the morning. And finally, he decided, okay, maybe I was right and he was wrong, but he wasn't going to admit it. <laughs> and it was, that was one where our colonel, we referred to as Uncle Joe, he was the neatest colonel I ever worked for. That was the only time I think I ever saw the man get upset. RCO, which Colonel Nelson, if there was an emergency launch at four in the morning, he would get up and he would be at the line shack and he would not leave the line shack, not his office, but the line shack where everybody, you know, until the birds come home. He was always there. He flew missions like that. I mean, there's not too many COs that do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we commonly referred to him as Uncle Joe because it was Joe Nelson. And we were sorry when he got transferred. But like I say, we had, I hate to say it, but I had a whole hell of a lot of fun over there. I mean, your mind break, blocks out the bad stuff. Your mind bro broke out when Skosh got killed. And me and Crutcher went out and we recovered the body. Well, we covered him alive and we got him to Delta Med. And the next day, Crutch had to go back to Delta Med to re And what upset us there is we wanted to land and the particular pilot we had that day would not land. And we think if we would have landed, he would have lived. Uh, the bird crashed, the VC came up and executed. The pilot, the co-pilot and the gunner shot suit ahead. Uh, Skosh Snyder, we, Skosh means little, mm -hmm. uh, was laying under the bodies and they just took it for granted he was dead. Well, when a team went out to recover him, it was 12, 14 hours later, they found out he was still alive and to this day I blame uh, this particular pilot because he didn't have the balls to go down and land us so we could go see. He was one of these that, I'm not going to get hurt, I'm going home alive. Everybody else is flying at treetop level. And he wants to fly at 5,000 foot. Uh, he was always volunteering for the mail runs and stuff like that where they were non-combat missions. And let's just say he wasn't too well liked. Uh, I don't know when you were in, but there used to be fraggings in Vietnam. We got a sergeant major who came into our outfit and we called him Spanky 
He was a little guy. And he was a total jerk. Well, the first two times, it was just smoke grenades rolled into his hut. And he kept wanting everybody to be spit and polish. And we tried to tell him, you weren't spit and polish. He wanted everybody to wear rank. And we told him, you don't wear rank because they'll shoot at rank. Uh, he wanted our boots polished. And we said, we don't polish our boots. They're a fire hazard. This, that, and the other. Well, the third time they threw in a concussion grenade, and I think he got the message and decided to get transferred out of there. He had us fall in from formation one day, and he come up to us, and the crew members, and he says, where's your, where's your rifles? I said, I don't have a rifle. I got six M60s. Well, you were issued a rifle when you come to Vietnam. I said, yeah. I said, I gave it away. I said, some grunt I was talking with, he, they had given him an M16, and he hated it. I gave him my M14, because that's when they came out with the M16s, so what everybody referred to as the Matty Mattel toys, because Matty Mattel actually put a, so, and they always malfunction. so I gave the guy my M16, I, or my M14. Uh, I did carry a pump sawed-off shotgun as my, besides a, they gave me a 38 snub nose, which I didn't ever figured out why they gave us crews those, because they wouldn't, you know. They couldn't hit it. Couldn't, I mean, what are you going to do with a 38 snub nose revolver? All right. So I, I talked to a guy that was going home. I bought his sawed off shotgun from him, and I carried that as my sidearm. Uh, like I said, we, we did so many things that were. Unregulation, unmarine corps. Did you ever get into Saigon? No, I flew in, but that was it. Mm -hmm. I, I, the farther south I got was Tonsonet, which was an Air Force base. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard, I heard great things about Saigon. <laughs> you know, I heard of people down there actually lived like real people. <laughs> uh, basically, somewhat in Da Nang, they lived like real people. Now, did you uh, experience any? Any problem with uh, drugs while you were in Vietnam? Not you personally, I mean about people in the areas. We never did because we were too busy flying. Now we all, a bunch of us, six, six choppers, damn near all got high one day. We had an LZ picked out and they went in and they napalmed it and it happened to be a marijuana field. And we're flying around in that smoke. And finally, the one pilot says, I think something's wrong, because everybody's starting to get the giggles. And we got the hell out of there, you know. And uh, they actually had to call off the landing and find a new LZ, because they said even if they had landed in that ash and kicked it up, it would have been just like the grunts getting uh, involved in it again. No, uh, the, uh, we uh, drank. Yeah. Um, I lost my train of thought there for a minute. When you're talking about drugs. He's talking about napalm. Uh, how often were you around where napalm w was used? Every day. Every day? Every day. Matter of fact, there was times that they actually dropped the napalm without detonators in it. So it would hit and spread, and then I'd open up with my 60 with the tracers to ignite mm -hmm. it, and that way it got to soak in more. Uh, I was around Agent Orange. I helped spray Agent Orange. I have Myself and Crutcher and all that, a bunch of others, have the side effects of Agent Orange. They, they are a heart attack. I've had that. Diabetes, I have that. I lost all my teeth. Cataracts. Uh, I went to the VA about it. My buddies are going and they're getting like $800 a month. Well, I went up there and I found out I had to give up my private physicians. I have to go to VA doctors. And I thought, nah, for $800, a month, I would rather have my own heart specialist, my own private doctor, and you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I was around Napalm. I saw the Air Force drop it, the Marine Corps dropped it, the Navy. It was a very impressive weapon, especially during Ted of '68 when they were flying around, uh, dropping it just outside the uh, wire at case on it. I mean, they were dropping it within. 50 yards of friendlies. They'd say we're coming in, everybody would lay down, get as flat as they could, and they'd mm -hmm. drop the napalm in that. Uh, 
it, it's not a pleasant thing to smell. You never forget that smell. Uh, now, this Agent Orange, is that what you called it when you uh, spread it over? Yeah, that's what it was called, Agent Orange. Agent Orange. You, you had no idea Nobody though, did. Uh, the effects of it. Uh, All I knew is it killed everything it touched on that was plant life. But I don't think anybody had any. We didn't wear masks. We didn't wear gloves. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we put a 55 gallon drum in the back of our Huey and they'd run a hose down. And when we get over to Target, I'd throw a valve and it just let the let it drain out of the 55 gallon drum out of this garden hose. And mm -hmm. Now our government today in 2016, <laughs> do they recognize and compensate our men that uh, suffer that, those effects? Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Mostly no. Our government doesn't recognize or compensate anybody. Uh, when I was in Vietnam, it was called combat fatigue you get. Mm -hmm. Now it's what, post-traumatic stress. Yeah. Yeah. It's that now. Uh, when I think of our government, the way they treat the veterans, I'm sorry. I, like I say, when I came home from Vietnam, I, I was still in the military, but I wore civilian clothes any time I was off base because I was spit on. I was called everything under the sun. Uh, you know, Uncle Sam, if they'd spend half as much time working with the veterans as they do with all this other goofy garbage they give foreign aid and everybody else they're giving money to, things would change. But it, it never will because politicians are what they are, politicians. Yes, we've experienced that in a lot of different interviews. If uh, uh, <clears throat> where the men that have the same answers as you do about that, uh, I made a, I, I'm, I'm, I made a mistake. We were back here a couple months. And Crutcher calls me one night. I'd become a cop. Crutcher went to work for Cincinnati Bell. He says, "Let's go to this Vietnam Veterans Association meeting." I was okay. I said, "I might be able to handle that," because I was made. A member of a v, uh, VFW over in Kentucky. Uh, when you were active, they, a friend of my dad's was a member there, and he mentioned me. Which in, one was that? It's over. It's over in Covington. Kelly Furnish. I don't know. I'd have to. It's been so long since I looked at cards, and that, but I think that was it. But anyway, uh, they would adopt active duty members, and this guy was a member, and he told him about me, and so. I became a member for life because of active duty there. And, you know, I went to a couple of those when I got home, and it was kind of somewhat like a party atmosphere. And the World War II guys talked World War II guys together, and the Korean War guys, and the Vietnam vets. And there'd be a little interchanging at the bar and that, and what have you. But Crutch says, come on, there's a Northside has a Vietnam veterans. Let's go to that. And Crutch lived in Clifton, I lived here, and I says, okay, we'll go. It was a pity party. Mm -hmm. All it was is, woe is me, woe is this. And I'm thinking, no, 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 this ain't the way it should be. You're supposed to be picking each other up. And if you have a problem, you know, help each other. Uh, then I started hearing about all the stuff with the Vietnam vets being homeless, living them, doing this. I thought, no, those were the weak ones. They were going to do this. I don't care if they went to Vietnam or not. They were going to be this person that used drugs or was homeless, this, that, or the other because of bad potty training or their mother didn't feed them right or something. These were weak, weak people. Uh, just about everybody I knew that came back from Vietnam became a productive citizen. You said you became a, a cop uh, where? Cincinnati. I was a Cincinnati cop for 27 years. Uh -huh. And uh, what years were that? Uh, 1971 through, well, count my military time. I retired in 1994. I retired when I was 48 years old. Mm -hmm. And then I bought my military time, which gave me 27 years total on yeah. the force. Yeah. 
Al uh, Hammond. Did you know Al Hammond? Oh, did I know Big Al? Hell yes. Everybody yeah. knew Al. He uh, he used to always give us care packages, you know, because he ran the, with Lee Hightower, they ran the firing range. Well, let me tell you a little secret about Lee Hightower. You know how tall Lee was? Yeah, he was, a, he, let me, uh, he's a member of our breakfast group before he passed. Okay, uh, he was almost seven foot tall. No, no. No, Lee Hightower was on the. Uh, I knew the, him from the range in that. There was. He was on the Hornet. Um, okay, well, there was a high tower. There was another high tower in the police department that was almost seven foot tall. His walking mate downtown was Bill Wheatmartian, who was seven foot two. They have pictures of them standing around these 1940 cars with their elbows on the roof. Wheatmartian was one of my sergeants, and he used to tell everybody, they'd ask him how tall he was. And he says, I'm six feet, 14 inches. He wore a size 27 shoe. That's where he picked up the name Bigfoot. There was another one, two of them there, Tom and Dan. Uh, my goodness, Tom, uh, they both uh, had the swing bar area down there on Vine Street. Uh, that was a good, I hung there as a kid. Huh? Um, I hung down a swing bar when I was 18 years old. God, I it was a nice bar back then. For some then. reason, I can't remember Tom's Well, those were all the walking beats down there. Yeah. I knew most of them. Yeah. It was like the ones we, I, I walked Avondale in that. We had two twins up there. Last name was Stewart. They were both in the Marine Corps. Identicals. One would get in one car, one would get in the other car. And the dope area isn't up that. The one would come down turn off a of Harvey and that, and turn on Burn It. And all the dopers would be, you know, giving it this stuff. Well, when he got up to Erkenbrecker and turned, his brother would be pulling on. Yeah. Just as soon as this cruiser got out of sight, this cruiser pulled on. And they'd always, how do you guys get around so fast, you know? One question here, it comes to my mind here. Uh, we forgot to mention about your wife. And uh, you went, um, you, you, okay, my uh, wife. You, when did you meet your wife? And well, I met her before I joined the Marine Corps. At uh, high school? Or no, no. Uh, I was at a bar called the Starfire Lounge out in Old Princeton Bowl. Yeah. I I used to, let me interrupt you there one time, once more. And your wife's uh, name? When it's June Harris, or June Brink, her maiden name. Brink? Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, <clears throat> I, was, I was underage, and I went, all my buddies were 21 and what have you. And we went out to this Princeton Bowl. They had this lounge in there with a band and everything. The Tri-County Shopping Mall. Yeah. Well, we go in there, and they card all my buddies. Well, I always went in last because I was taller than them. So when it got to me, they usually would just stamp me 21 and let me come in. Well, I was in there half drunk on my mind. And I tripped over this table, and there were six girls sitting at this table. And being drunk and not caring the world, I looked at them and said, Hey, one of you want to dance? And that's how I met her. <laughs> uh, later on, I didn't, you know, get any, know her that well then. A few weeks later, a buddy of mine got invited to a party, and we went to the party, and she was there with her boyfriend at that party. And we talked there, and her boyfriend was a jerk. <laughs> Put a blunt, he was. He had money, and he flaunted it, but, you know. Well, she more or less decided, she gave me her phone number. And she wasn't, she was going with the guy, but not nothing permanent. So I called her and we started dating. And then I went to the Marine Corps. And when I went to Vietnam, she actually went to live in Hawaii. For just a couple of years, I was in Vietnam. What was she doing over there? She, a microbiologist, which is the person that makes doctors look smart. Right. She's the one that looks through the microscope and runs all the tests to find out what's wrong with you. And then she tells the doctor, and he says, well, you take two aspirin and call me in the morning yeah. or whatever. Who's she working for? She, at that time, she was in a hospital over there. When she came back here, she worked at Christ for a while. She worked for Shriners for a couple of years. And then she got into the Mercy system. She worked Mercy Hamilton till they closed, and then she went up to Mercy Mount Airy and worked there till she retired. So... But, you're corresponding by mail then? No. Well, that, and she's in Hawaii, and uh, my outfit, you actually got an R. Most outfits, you were lucky if you got one R&R &R while you are in Vietnam. 
our outfit, you could get an R&R &R every month because we flew so much, our colonel would get all these extra R&Rs for us, the one I called Uncle Joe. Right. And about every other month, I get to Hawaii to see her. Outstanding. Yeah, it was, and it was funny as uh, we had a bunch of pilots from our outfit coming to Vietnam, uh, coming to Hawaii to meet their wives and that, and they'd call her up to find out what bars to go to and where to go to eat and stuff like that. Or like the one day I'm sitting on the back deck smoking a cigarette and drinking a carton of milk and four of my pilots walk up with their wives. Well, she was at work, so, you know, I thought, okay, I'll go drinking with you guys. I don't care. And I know you kind of looked at me when I said drinking a carton of milk. That was the thing I missed most in Vietnam, milk. And then my parents knew a doctor stationed in a uh, station at the Navy base there, he was a brain surgeon. He met us a couple times. Uh, he got us on one of the boats to go out to the Arizona, which if either one of you gentlemen have ever done the Arizona, you know what it is. Yes. But back then they didn't have the big memorial. The right. Navy handled it and you got on one of their long boats. It was just a, you, and you went out and you just kind of cruised around and then you went back and we did that a couple of times. We went to Punch Bowl. We, you know, did all the Hawaii stuff every time I'd go on R&R. &R. Usually the first day or two there, I'd just sleep, and then, then we'd do something for two or three days, and then it was time to go back to Vietnam. How long did you get there on your typical R&R? &R? Uh, six days. Six days. Well, they gave you seven, but with all the different time changes, it was actually six. So... Uh, where, when did you get married and where, what was the location of it? Got married back here in Cincinnati. I was still in the Marine Corps. Got married on a weekend and I had to report back to base. Okay. I got and married at Corpus Christi Church up. And where was your wife? Was she, she wasn't in Hawaii. At no, time. no, she had come back here after I got back here. And she was living right up the street at her mother's house. And I came in on a weekend and we got married and then I had to report back to base. And <laughs> So your wife stayed here in the city while yeah. you were in the service? Yeah. And then I finished up at Gross Hill, Michigan, and then Selfridge Air Force Base for my last two quick hops in Michigan. And then I came back to Cincinnati, and then I became a cop. Yeah. Um, and uh, Al, I was, he was, uh, now I mentioned his name before, but now I can't. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. He used to always fix up a care package for us because he did all the reloading out there. Yeah. At the, uh, we all belonged to Seven Hills Rod and Gun Club. We had about 10 or 12 of the policemen from Cincinnati with us and a lot of city employees. Um, well, you know where else a lot of... We had, so we had our free access to ammo. But oh, yeah. I, Every, I, uh, I digress here, but... Uh, no. Nah. Um, well, there was another gun club that nobody knew really existed at Hartwell Golf Course down here off of Codwell. It's the CG&E golf course and that. There's actually, in the one building in the basement, the main building, there was a target range here people didn't know about. Never heard of it, you're right. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brian, uh, do you have any questions at this point? Yeah, I was, uh, just want you know, Vietnam seems to be the, where helicopters are being a lot, using a lot more than, than I mean, they were only... It I was new. Were just, yeah. It was just coming into being, and it all of a sudden became... It could get people in and out, pick people up, move wounded, everything very fast, okay? So the helicopters, like I say, my squadron got over there in the end of June, 1966. Uh, they came over by boat. I come over later on a plane. But, you know, your big fixed wing were just used to bring in supplies and what have you. Uh, there was no front lines. There was no line. So like a C-130 might be coming in, let's say a Quang tree at our field there and take sniper fire. We had two guys we called one-shot Louis. Every night when we go out on a mission, 
they'd take a shot at us. When we're coming in, they'd take a shot at us. Well, the one night, my pilot says, this is bullshit. He says, Pete, you know where they shoot from? I says, yeah, it's right over there. It's a little uh, Buddha place, you know. Uh, I says, they're both in there. Well, we come in, I opened up with my machine gun. They never shot at us again. I don't know if I hit them or just scared the hell out of them. Would you have any sense of how many, uh, the fleet or whatever you want to call, like a bunch of, how, 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 how much was helicopters being used in Vietnam, would you say? I mean, how many were in use or? Oh, hundreds. Uh, you, in Vietnam, you had VMO2, VMO3, well, they were, always flying around VIPs or USO shows. And you had us, VMO6. We picked up all the, as we called the sandwich runs, where anything could happen and did. Uh, there was four 46 outfits with 24 birds per outfit. There was four 34 outfits. The Army, God knows how many Hueys they had. Uh, the Army's the dumbest asses in the world. They fly everything in formation. That's why in Kuwait, Iraq, and all that, they were losing all these choppers. I don't know if you watch the news. You'd see their gunbirds come in, they'd flare, they'd tilt forward and fire. And they're not going anywhere. They're just sitting there shooting. We had a theory. The lower and faster we could fly, the least likely we were to get hit. We went on a mission in the Eshaw Valley with the Army. And there was 10 of our outfit, and there was probably 60 Army Hueys and some 46s and 53s. The Air Force had 53s and Hueys over there. Uh, we're sitting at this briefing, and this Army colonel's up there, and he's telling us that 25% of the flight going out is written off, that we're going to get shot down, captured. With. And there was an Army guy sitting here and an Army colonel sitting here, and I looked at both of them, I said, Shame you two are going to get shot down. I'm sitting there drinking my coffee and smoking my cigarette. And he said, what do you mean? I said, because we're not going to fly the same formations you guys fly. VMO6 people, we're going to fly so damn low to the ground that we're liable to be sucking up straw into our intakes or be below the palm trees. I actually took two hits of my greenhouse flying at sea level. The greenhouse is on top of you. That means we were lower in the palm trees the snipers were in, and they were shooting down at us. But the Army's idea is, oh, we're going to make this neat V formation. You know, we're going to ooh, go in and flare and sit down. And No, we didn't do it that way. And that's why the Army guys on the ground called us in over our own gunships, because they knew we were going to be low and fast and we were going to do the job. So. And the base that you were at, was that a Marine base? Or yeah. What was it? yeah. So how, how big was that? Okay. Uh, Keyhaw was the larger the bases we were at, and it actually had two 34 squadrons, two 46 squadrons, and us. When we moved to Fubai, it was one 46 squadron, one 34 squadron, and us. When we moved to Quang Tri, it was one 46 squadron and us, because now we're up at the DMZ. What do you mean by 46? And, Four, 46 yeah. is a cargo helicopter. It's a big, with two props on top. Okay. The uh, Army flies 47s, and we flew with 46. It's just, I am not sure the difference. And like I say, the 34s were the ones that looked like giant frogs with the big nose and the wheels that came down, the struts, and the pilot sits way up high. But, uh, as the farther north we moved, the smaller the number of aircraft were there. And was it kind of like, were you just like intense, like you see like... No, we were in what they called hooches. And what they were, were <laughs> two by fours that we stole, and screens that we stole. And we got the CBs come in, and they built a frame, and they'd put the screen around, and they put in two doors, and put in a kick-out panel, and... We'd go get some corrugated metal, put on for a roof, and that's what we lived in. And we lived higher than most people. Most of us had bunks. We had a uh, LST on a New Year's, the first New Year's Eve I was over there. 
wash up on the rocks and get stuck. Well, after about a month of the Navy trying to get this LST off the rocks, they gave up on it and they were going to come in and salvage it. Well, they made the mistake and left it unattended. And it was right below our, our area in Vietnam in Kiha. Well, we immediately had people go down. We stripped out the bunks. We stripped out the officers' quarters with their beds. Uh, we stripped out any coolers we could strip, washing machines, generators, you name it. We salvaged it. Well, when the Navy came back, it was like, what the hell happened? But like our CO, he had a big bed with a real mattress. Uh, we had mattresses on our beds instead of uh, sleeping on what they call rubber ladies, which was noth nothing but an inflatable plast or rubber raft, you know, those little rubber mattresses. Mm -hmm. That's what most, most of the people over there, some of them slept on those on a cot. Well, our outfit, we all got beds that we took off the ship and mattresses and pillows and so your Kiha was right at there at the coast then? Yeah. Matter of fact, when I golfed down at the golf course, there was a guy come up one day and we were talking. He was a sailor on that ship. The LSD? Yeah. Or, or, mm. He was a sailor and he's talking. Hell, I helped. I says, I remember that thing because we went to bed on a New Year's Eve and we woke up the next day and there's a damn boat in our backyard. And he says, that was a ship. <laughs> I'm sorry, Navy. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Brian. Well, I was wondering, did you have much problems when you had to repair the helicopter getting stuff like supplies or equipment to, well, to repair it or tools? Or like I say, uh, we stole a lot of stuff from the Army. What was theirs was ours if we could get it. Uh, we would uh, cannibalize one helicopter to get three helicopters flying if we had to. And then when the parts came in, we'd fix that one again. Or when we could get another Huey, we, if the Army sat down somewhere, we'd go get it and bring it. If we had to fly it back under a 53 or we could fly it back on its own and then strip it out and you'd use, put the, what we didn't need, put spare parts away till some somebody did need them. We, uh, what's yours was ours and what's ours was ours. This is the way it went. If you made the mistake and landed and decided your helicopter wasn't safe to fly, we were going to get it and get every part off of what we could use. Uh, and that's how we kept helicopters flying, and that's why we actually had more helicopters than our squadron was supposed to have. Well, was weather much of a factor? Not to our squadron. We took off in the fog where you couldn't see from me to you. We took off in rain where you couldn't see from me to you. We went on our medevacs where we couldn't see until we were 50 feet before we hit the ground. I mean, you know, my pilots were the craziest asses in the world, and God love every one of them, because, except for a couple of them. Well, like I stated earlier in that, we, Begged, borrowed, and stole so much stuff. We had one pilot that somehow he came up with a big forklift. We went to an army area and he knocked the fence down, went in with that forklift, stole a whole pallet of beer. You know, that's how our outfit operated on. And every colonel we had, as our COs and our XOs and that, they just let us go. We had a kid in the outfit. His dad was in the Navy and flew uh, submarine hunters out of Japan. Well, he would fly in once a week so he could get his combat pay. And he'd bring us a couple uh, pallets of uh, Orient beer. Stuff had a kick to it. Uh, we had some Air Force guys come in for a few hours. So they get their combat pay. We had some goofy pilots in my outfit actually fly as my gunner because they wanted crew wings. There was four pilots in our outfit that had crew wings besides their pilot wings because they thought it was cool. So they actually went out and earned their 10 combat missions to get, you know, stuff like, and that, it's just basically our outfit 
worked. Uh, a lot of people kid around that we were a combination of F Troop, Hogan's <laughs> Heroes. Uh, what was that one? McHale's Navy. That oh my God. It was just a bunch of, it, nobody cared. We didn't. Well, you obviously cared about your job. But the, well, we, we were great at our job, but nobody cared about, like I say, if you got a chicken shit uh, metal, you know, Purple Heart, the next one you earned. It was, it was a given in our outfit. If you just got something, you know, small, you didn't get a Purple Heart for that. Like I said, when I got hit, technically I could have gotten a Purple Heart. I didn't. Uh, my buddy Crutcher, as I mentioned many times, he saved my life. Co-pilot got hit. I'm working on the co-pilot. I'm leaning over. He stands up to help me. He takes one right in the ass. It would have hit me right in the head. We're back in the States. He's in Quantico. Invited to this party with all muckety-mucks and politicians and what have you. And we just happened, my pilot wanted to fly to Quantico that weekend to see somebody. So I went with him, so I meet Crutch, and he goes to this party. And there's these young ladies around, and one of them says, well, did you ever get shot in Vietnam? And Crutcher looked right at her and says, yeah, I took one in the right cheek. <laughs> and they, all three girls were looking at his face and then he says, boy, they did an amazing job. He says, oh, no. He drops his pants right at this party and says, right here. Well, we were asked to leave. But, you know. Did, well, you mentioned he was from Cincinnati. Did you know him before or did you meet him there? And yes, and, yes and no. We went to the, some of the same parties here in Cincinnati. We knew some of the same people when we were at those parties in high school and stuff. Well, we're in Vietnam, I'm there about a week, and the old Cincinnati Post and Time Star would mail the daily paper to people in Vietnam free. Well, you get a couple weeks late, but still it was the hometown paper. I'm sitting there one day, and I'm smoking a cigarette and drinking a cup of coffee, and I'm reading the paper, and all of a sudden this guy comes screaming up, jumps up, grabs my newspaper. What are you doing with my paper? And he's carrying on, I'm looking, and this guy is maybe 5'10", five, 5'11", five, or about big around as my little finger. His nickname was Skinny Kid. I jumped up, I'm gonna drop him like a bad habit, you know. Well, we started talking. He lived in Clifton, I lived in Avondale. We started talking about schools and parties and f f found out we went to the, hung with some of the same people and that. So that's, that's how I met Crutcher. I was wondering, do you remember your first day in Vietnam? Do you have your first impressions of of, uh, My first day was when I landed to Nang. It was just sheer madness. I had no idea what was going on. Because you landed there, there was supplies being moved. There was people coming in, people going out. Airplane, one airplane after another, jets taking off. You know, it was just, what? And all of a sudden, they load you on this school bus. It's painted green, and it's got screen wire mesh down the windows. And they're moving you up to uh, Keyhaw. And I remember wondering why the screen was there. And then I found out it was keep people throwing grenades in the window on you. But yeah, the first day was just, you're scared. You're excited. There's just so much going on. It's just a blur. You know, the first day or two was just blurs. And then once I settled in, in the squadron, then it, you know, Things started becoming reality, and I realized what was going on. Did you have much contact with native Vietnam people? Maybe? Yeah, when I lived with the Mountain Yards. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you mentioned them. And Mountain also... Uh, Why were they... They were called Mountain Yards? Mountain Yards. Yard. Yeah. They are they are a, a tribe over there that the lowland Vietnamese hate. Everybody in Vietnam hated the Mountain Yards. And they they were mercenaries for us. They were little people... They lived up in the highland around Quezon and what have you, and they were just, they were great. I did get in contact with a lot of different villages that really liked the Americans because the crops they grew and stuff, they got to keep because we were there. Uh, we had some Vietnamese come in and do laundry, and we had one little guy, 
he was called the Clipper. He he was our barber, and I always wondered, you know, when he was going to slit our throat because he cut your hair and everything with a straight razor. But you know, you got to know them. You got to know the some women that came in to do our laundry. Uh, it was a case of we had a shower area and they'd come in to do laundry and we'd be flying all night and I needed a shower. I didn't care. They didn't care. I walked in, took a shower right in front of them. Of course, the water was being pumped directly from the river, so it was really clean too, you know, but I felt clean. I know sometimes the guys you talk to, they had a lot of snipers when they were on the base. I mean, well, you had any, any episodes of that? We did. One thing, if you went to the use one of the outhouses at night and they were nothing but a screen with a roof on it and some of them were three holers some of them were four holers to go in uh, you didn't smoke a cigarette in them at night you lit up because you go the next day and you see four or five bullet holes in the screen and even though nobody was in there they'd take a shot at you uh, so you never lit up a cigarette at night I actually worked with some snipers or hung out with them up at Quezon, and they would lay on these bunkers for hours on end at night, waiting to see somebody light up a cigarette a half mile away, a mile away, and pop. And as soon as they shot, they would roll off each side down to a lower bunker area because their snipers would be shooting back at the flash. But, uh, you know, and like I say, we had the ones that were at the end of the runway there for a while in the pagoda that were always wanting to take one or two shots at us when we were coming in or going out. Uh, first time I was ever around Vietnamese fish and scared the hell out of me. I'll admit it. My butt puckered. They used hand grenades. They'd go to the river, pull a grenade, throw it in. All the fish that floated up, they'd get in those little basket boats of theirs, paddle out, scoop up all the fish. And that's how they fished. And, you know, I thought we were under attack. Until I was told, oh, they're just fishing, don't worry. I mean, I don't know if you know any guys you talked to experienced that, but where we were at, that was became a common thing of them fishing. And don't ask me where they got the hand grenades. I have no idea. Probably uh, black market from, yeah, from the army. <laughs> Whoever they could rip them off from. That was another thing. You learned to buy stuff you needed, like boots and that. You went into the ville and bought them on the black market. Uh, of course, we got even with them for a while. We used Monopoly money. They thought it was MPC, which is military mm -hmm. payment currency, currency, and it was little money and it changed <laughs> colors. Well, we'd take Monopoly money in. As far as they thought it was MPC. So we're buying a boots we need with Monopoly. And everything was great until the Army came in, and the Army explained to them that that was phony money. The Army ruined everything. <laughs> I hate to say it. The Air Force had it made. They had everything. The Army would ruin it, and we'd take it. Uh, um, I was wondering, uh, uh, you obviously were make mechanically inclined. How come you didn't uh, make that a post-military career? I didn't have the college degree. Even though I had flight hours, many, many hours as a co-pilot, I wasn't an officer. I wasn't a gentleman. So everything I did in Vietnam didn't count. Working on aircraft, you have to have what they call airframe power plant license. I learned it in the military. Unless, at the time, Purdue, and there was two other colleges that gave those degrees out, unless you had one of them degrees, it didn't count. I could go and work. I actually went up to a whole Blue Ash Airport, and the guy was going to take me on as an apprentice when I first got home to work on aircraft, but I was only allowed to do minute stuff. Basically, I was going to be what they call a wing wiper, wipe the bird down, clean the windshield up, make sure it's fueled, but I couldn't work on the engines or nothing. I, I don't want to do this because I didn't have the degree. So, you know, I had a whole lot more hours than a lot of civilian pilots had, but it didn't count. Uh, when I was on the police department and Vietnam was winding down, Cincinnati Police Department was offered 20 Hueys so we could have our own air care in that. 
The city of Cincinnati said no. They says, Paul, we don't have this, we don't have that. We actually had people like me that knew how to fly. We had people that were Army pilots, knew how to work on the engines. But the city says, no, we don't want anything like that. Uh, you had like Columbus, I think they took 50 of them. Uh, Cleveland took them, everybody took them but Cincinnati. Later in life, we came up with AR care, but you know, back when we could have, no. Uh, it was just the way it was, so. Well, how did you uh, end up being a cop? How'd that come about? A bet. I had a job working where my dad worked, and I was driving a truck. And we were sitting in there on a Saturday, and we were bullshitting me and three other drivers. And they had been with the company for 10, 15, 20 years. And I says, man, I ain't going to do this all my life. And they said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. So I picked up the newspaper, and there was a thing. The city was taking applications for police and firemen. What, what year would have that been? Uh, 70, right after I got out of service. And, that, and I said, okay, I'm going to go take this test. Bullshit, blah, blah, blah. I went down, I took the test. Things progressed, and... I was being interviewed by the fire department. I was being interviewed because back then you just took one civil service test in the police department. Well, finally it got to the police department. They says you've been accepted. Your academy date starts here. I went back to work. I said, "I'm giving you a two-week notice. I'm quitting. I'm being accepted." I told my dad and I told these guys I was driving with. He says, "What? Yeah, I'm going to be a cop." Well, the funny part was. I was in the police academy a week, and I get a call from the fire department. I had been accepted in their academy. And I didn't know I'd made the wrong choice. Well, I didn't, but, you know, the fireman kind of had it made. On one, off two, sleep half the night. But, yeah, I says, well, okay, so that's how I became a cop, on a bet. What yeah. year was that? I got on the job in 71. 71. And were you a beat cop? I did it all at one time. I ended up being a supervisor. How you see me now is cleaned up. I, one time I had a ZZ top beard, hair down the middle of my back. I was undercover for many, many years. Oh, were you doing like vice stuff? Uh, I worked federal auto theft. I worked the motorcycle gangs. I worked drug, gambling, liquor. Then I was also a beat cop for several years. And then I was a supervisor as a beat supervisor. And then I was undercover as a supervisor. And when they told me I could retire, I says that. I saw the changing of the police department. It was becoming what I called the Charmin police, softer, kinder, gentler. And I was brought up by the old dinosaur cops that would crack you across the ass with their nightstick and tell the little kids to get off the street and stuff. And I decided it was time to go. What year did you retire? 1994. Now, you ready for this? Yes. Went to the Marine Corps on March 13th, which was Friday. Right. Got discharged from the Marine Corps, March 13th, which was a Friday. 70. Retired from the police department, March 13th. 1994. Four, yeah. Which was a Friday. Uh, well, that's 13 is my lucky number. It is a lucky number. It has always been. Yeah. What uh, what was the date of your marriage? July 12th? 15th. 15th. What year? 1968. Uh, 68. 69. Yeah. 68. And how many children did you have? I have three, right, miss? That's correct. <laughs> yeah. And what are their names? Michelle or Mickey, Melissa or Missy, and Jody. And uh, what were they? I have three daughters, and they're all great. All I ever wanted was healthy. Yes. I had people ask me when Jody was, June was pregnant with Jody, you want a boy this time? And I said, no, I only want healthy. Healthy, right. Um, how many grandchildren do you have? Seven, and a, seven plus one. I have seven grand-grandchildren, mm -hmm. my grandchildren. And Missy has a stepson. But to keep things from being confused, Say, he had too many people that wanted to be his grandpa. He's, so. he's got eight. Yeah, so. Okay. How about any great-grandchildren? No, not yet. My no. grand, 
My oldest granddaughter will be 19 November the 4th. She shares my birthday. So yeah. when she was young, we always had problems because I always was kidding her. Yeah. She couldn't have a birthday till I had mine. Has, has anybody inherited your height? My oldest Missy, or Mickey, she's quite tall. Uh, my grandkids are all getting it. I got a couple granddaughters are almost six foot. I got a grandson, six four, six five now. How tall is Jake? About five ten? Uh, probably five eight, but he's only thirteen. So, so yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Well, my grandson is six four, six five right now. He's a freshman at Elder. Uh, he's got a foot and makes my foot look small. He's a puppy, and if he ever grows up to his feet, he's going to be huge. So how would you keep yourself busy after you retired as a cop? What were, what well, I had a, I started, I did some security work for Cincinnati Country Club, and it started out as 12 hours a week, and it progressed and got so big that I actually had to hire her husband and another guy, because we were, and I was still working 30 hours a week over there, and I just worked, because my wife was still working at the time, she was a bacteriologist, and so I worked over there and did that, and then I'd pick up other security jobs for members at the club. And I wondered how I used to get everything done and still still work, which, you know, I was doing everything I did before I retired, and I was never had enough hours. And then me and her, we started traveling a whole bunch. When she was getting near ready to retire, we were, we were taking five, six, seven vacations a year traveling to all the national parks and everything in Cincinnati or in Ohio and Kentucky and all across the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, save your money. You must go to Alaska. And when you go, take the trains. It's fabulous. The next choice is Yosemite Falls. The next choice is the Tetons and Yellowstone. Key Largo. Uh, we went to Myrtle Beach so much, it don't count. You go to Smoky Mountain so much, it don't count. Uh, we went to Vegas twice, and the one time we went over to Death Valley, and it rained a week before we got there. You could not describe the beauty. Another time we went to Vegas, we went to Zion National Park and Bryce National Park mm -hmm. in Utah. Gorgeous. Uh, we went to Costa Rica one we used to take cold weather vacations. We went to Costa Rica. The only problem there is it's become the new uh, spring break for people and kids in Texas and all that. I never saw so many drunk teenage kids in my life as was there because they have no drinking ages. But it's a beautiful country. So. Did you keep in touch? I mean, obviously you have uh, the guy uh, from here, was there anybody else that you uh, served with that you kept in touch with over the years? Well, off and on I'll hear from uh, Captain Cobb. His nickname was Irish. He flies uh, a lumber helicopter out in Washington where they go in and they lumber the trees and he flies them out with a chopper. Uh, several of the other ones I knew and heard of have died of cancer. At a young age, Denny Price, he became an FBI agent. I knew him there, and he was probably early 50s, and he died of cancer, which mm -hmm. uh, a couple of the other ones I knew, and I'd hear every, every once in a while you'd get a glimpse of the Facebook or something or an email. There's a guy, Art Friend, is, he goes by Alpha Golf, and his Alpha Golf 9, because his chopper was not, or 7, his chopper was 7. I hear from him maybe once every three, four months. He became a lifer in the Marine Corps, and he worked his way up to lieutenant colonel. But he has so many concussions and has so many broken bones, he can't move around anymore. He was involved in at least a dozen crashes in Vietnam in choppers. A uh, couple of the other ones... Uh, there was a guy by the name of Dennis Eel, and when I first got back to Cincinnati, he was from this area, I heard from him. Uh, Pete Green, he was from Cincinnati. Matter of fact, I went to boot camp and then to Vietnam with him. 
heard from him off and on, but he lives up in uh, New England, and we were at one time planning to go into New England to, you know, see the flower or the changing of the leaves and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to see a whole bunch of them a couple years ago at Quantico. We had a memorial. Everybody kicked in and built a memorial for the people that died in VMO 6, including the old pilots from Korean War. Now, VMO 6 was back in World War II and Korea. Uh, and I got to see a whole bunch of them then. Uh, the end of July, there was a what they call Papa Smoke, which is a helicopter combat pilots or crew association of Marines. Uh, every two years they have a reunion. Well, this year it was in Jacksonville and we were having our 60th reunion or 50th reunion at the same time with Papa Smoke. And that's when I found out at least 30 to 35 more guys that I knew have passed away in the last few years. Uh, Rolling Thunder, have you ever, I take it you've heard of that. B-52s. Well, that, that's where it started from, but here in the States, Rolling Thunder is motorcycles, is Harleys. And what it was, was a, right, yeah. was a bunch of Marine Vietnam veterans that decided that things were going sideways and they got on, everybody met and they got on their bikes and rode to Washington. They rode through the middle of Washington down through the, uh, whatever that, where? The mall, the mall area and that, and then rode over to the wall. Well, the first year or so, it had five, six, seven thousand motorcycles. This past year, it was supposedly, rumor has it, had over a million motorcycles. Uh, several years ago, this Marine, he was in dress blues coming from somewhere, and he saw him coming by. He went and stood on an island at attention for seven hours, like this watching all the bikes come through. Since then, he has retired, but he still stands there in his blues, and another guy has joined him because it takes almost 12 hours from the time you leave the start area till you get to the finished area. Your, your top speed is three to four mile an hour. They come through Columbus on their way to Washington every year, day or two before uh, Memorial Day, and they'll come through in groups of 1,000, 1,500, and Columbus police and that actually escort them through on the interstates when they come through. Are they also part of the guys who do the funeral procession? They do. Well, some of those are those, and some of them are just the uh, Patriot Guard. And those are all your ex military. There's Rolling Thunder is just a conglomerate. They've accepted anybody that wants to ride in it now to pay tribute. Uh, like I say, at first it was just Marine veterans that did it. Uh, if you ever get a chance to do it, you're never going to see anything like it. That's all I can tell you. It's loud and it's just amazing. Uh, the Marine Corps has several different motorcycle clubs and they have one that rides out of Rickenbacker. You probably Columbus. know. Outside of Columbus, you Columbus know it well. Side. Well, that's where Lima Company was stationed. All those Marines that got killed at one at one go in Iraq. So there's a, a club up there, a membership, and I've, I've gotten information wanting to know if I wanted to join in that because I rode at one time. But uh, we were up there flying out of Rickenbacker, and they were having a meeting, and I saw all these guys coming in, and I guess you can tell the difference of the veterans. Somebody said one time, that you see the World War II vets and they're still kind of clean cut, but you know, you see the Korean War vets and they all got little beards or something. And you see the Vietnam vets and we all got the ponytails and the big beards. And, and you know what, it's true. But I, you know, it's, I, I just want to thank you two for letting me do this. And well, you know what? It's one of the few times I've talked to non-ex people I were, were around about my experience. Well, and I want to thank you again. Is, I want to thank you and thank you for allowing this interview and thank you for your patriotic well service to our country. Well, I, as I tell people, don't thank me 
find the relatives of people that didn't come home and thank them. Those are the ones you should be thanked. 